Does it work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, and uh, welcome to this session number uh, 48 of the Scenarios Forum. My name is Oleg Cherp, and I work in Lund University in Sweden and also in Central European University here in Austria. This session will be about visibility of scenarios, which is, as we will hear, an increasingly important topic. And um, it's also an increasingly difficult topic. Both conceptually and methodologically, there are different views of how to define and how to grapple it. And that's why I think this session is extremely important. In the first talk prepared by Jessica, who is co-facilitating the session, and myself, we will try to frame and structure some of these questions. And in particular, we will define what we see as the two very distinct perspectives on feasibility inside and the outside view. Jessica will not only speak about this, but also comment on some of the presentations to follow and how they echo this kind of distinction. Now, before I give Jessica the foot, let me, um, the floor, let me um, just propose some organizational elements of this session. We have 10 presentations. It's a long session with a break in between. And that means it is 180 minutes. And since we have 10 of them, we propose that we give 15 minute slot for each talk, and then we'll have 30 minutes left for discussion at the end. Now, within this 15 minute slot, we asked all the presenters to stay within seven or eight minutes, and that is okay if they stay until 10, but if you use all of your 15 minutes, there won't be any time for questions. And to remind you, I will raise this green thing after about eight minutes, and the yellow one after 10 minutes, and if you prefer not to have any questions and talk for 15 minutes, that's fine. After 15 minutes, I raise the red one and I will stand up. Okay. <laughs> and, so, so choose your time wisely. Now, and then that will be followed by questions. And also for the purpose of this session, let's accept the common definition of a question as a question is a short statement of interrogatory character followed by a question mark. Right? And then we, when we will have discussions and we can make other, other types of statements and contributions. Now with that, I think I mentioned everything and let me hand over to Jessica. Oh, by the way, Jessica, you know, I, I will give you slightly more time because you're not only talking about your thing, but also about the sort of contributing to discussion. So you get two more minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> very kind of you. Um, and a warm welcome uh, from my part as well to our session, and thank you for coming. And I'm going to talk about feasibility spaces for climate action and how we have been working to bridge um, between the, what we call the inside and the outside view. And there is this growing attention to feasibility. Um, in the latest Working Group 3 report from the IPCC, feasibility is mentioned uh, 400 times. That's about once every 13 pages. And why is this, what there, this increasing attention to feasibility? Well, we think this increasing attention is actually paradoxically because of the increasing seriousness about addressing climate change. So instead of just it being this mind game that scientists discuss at climate change conferences like ours, policymakers actually really want to know how to implement solutions in the real world. And that is why the IP PCC defines feasibility as the potential for a mitigation or adaptation option to be implemented. And there are two angles which approach this question of um, implementing options in the real world. And one of them is to take, um, I'm a little bit too uh, short for this um, stand. I think it was built for Austrians and Swedes. <laughs> uh, so I, one, one approach is to build, to develop better and better models um, and incorporate more and more aspects of the world. And the thinking here is that, okay, if we depict the world in a, a realistic and a sophisticated enough fashion, then the futures and the scenarios that we depict will actually be feasible or will actually approach feasibility. The other approach is to peer into the past and to say, okay, based on what we know about past transitions and past socioeconomic changes, what can we expect in the future and which of these futures and scenarios are feasible? 
And when we were preparing for this session, we started to ask ourselves, well, why isn't there more work bridging these two approaches? And we found an answer to this in early work from the Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, who introduced these, um, this conceptual distinction between the inside view and the outside view. Now, what is the inside view and the outside view? So the inside view focuses on the unique case at hand by considering the plan and the obstacles to it, its completion, by constructing scenarios of future progress, and it views risks as a challenge to be overcome by the exercise of skill and choice and commitment to a goal. And we see that this approach of building better models really is a good illustration of this inside view. So it focuses on climate mitigation as a unique policy problem. It develops climate mitigation pathways which meet climate targets. And when the feasibility discussion started coming up several years ago, the, um, the community started to talk about barriers and enablers to realizing these climate mitigation pathways. And finally, there's really a strong emphasis in this literature and this community on political will and capacity to implement these um, pathways. Now, in contrast, the outside view ignores the details of the case at hand and instead focuses on the statistics of a class of cases chosen to be similar in relevant respects to the present one. And I'm gonna highlight two really important ideas in this definition. The first is a class of cases similar to the target one, and the second is statistics of this class of cases. And the, in the rest of my talk, I'm gonna illustrate how we do this in our work and how we try to use this to bridge um, insights from the inside view. And we've been working on developing this outside view through the development of feasibility spaces, and we develop these feasibility spaces with three steps. The first is to identify a class of reference cases similar to the target case, the target case being a climate mitigation solution. The second step is to construct feasibility spaces based on reference case outcomes and their characteristics. And the third is to map scenarios or targets onto the feasibility space. And I will now illustrate this with um, a case from our own research. And so the target case that I'm talking about is coal decline. So we all know that to meet 1.5 or two degree targets, coal really needs to decline rapidly. And in this first example I'm showing you, our reference cases are significant and sustained fossil fuel decline episodes in electricity in large countries. So our reference outcome is the decline rate, so we measure this over 10 years, so that we really get these sustained um, episodes of decline. We also look at reference case characteristics of electricity demand growth, the system size, so we find higher rates are possible in smaller systems, and we also look at the substituting source. And this allows us to build a feasibility space where there are multiple precedents present um, and diverse types of episodes, where there are rarer precedents and only smaller systems, and be the feasibility frontier beyond which there are no precedents. We also identify identified fossil fuel decline under socioeconomic crises. We consider these as a reference case apart because while at first glance they may seem similar, they are actually quite different because this is not what we want to emulate to reach our target case of coal decline under continued economic growth. Now this feasibility space allows us to map scenarios and the coal decline depicted in scenarios onto, um, onto it so to see how the coal decline in scenarios compares to what we have experienced historically. This is um, 1.5 and 2 degree scenarios from the AR6 database and we can see that and I'm showing you now for Europe and we can see that Europe is well within the multiple precedented zone. Now, if we look at China, we see that ch the China, uh, the decline of China, the coal in China goes well within to the unprecedented zone. Now, one of the questions we commonly get when we uh, present this research is, well, but won't the future be different because now renewables are cheaper 
and countries are more serious about climate change. So what, is, what do these historical, long ago periods of fossil fuel decline have to do with what we're dealing with today, the challenges we're facing today? So one of the things we've done recently, and this is work in progress, is to build a database of all um, plans to phase out coal. So these are pledges and plans to phase out coal in different countries. And um, we, looked at the, we looked at the reference case characteristics of the time to the plan phase out, so how long the country is planning for its phase out, and also the share of coal on the x-axis. And we see a very clear relationship between the time to phase out and the share of coal in electricity. So this is not surprising. Long, uh, the more coal a country has in electricity, the farther into the future um, a country pushes its um, coal phase out target. Now what is surprising to us is that these rates do not exceed the fastest national rates that we have observed. Then we're able to um, map, um, again, scenario rates, scenario, uh, rates depicted in scenarios onto the space and we see that actually the rates um, in Europe in, in the scenarios are less, are um, slower than national pledges, and then in China uh, exceed pledges, uh, national pledged rates. Now, we've also started to work on uh, taking this to the national level because these are all global results where our reference cases are the whole class of um, cases, but we're also starting to experiment with looking at front runner cases or the most rapid cases we observe historically. So this is some work we recently did for um, Australia where our reference case was the most rapid declines in fossil fuels and electricity. So that's in the green in UK coal, um, and we shift these data to be able to compare it to the scenarios developed in Australia for its um, potential planned coal phase out. What we see, what the, the conclusions and the input that we're able to give then is that to realize this coal phase out, um, Australia would need to phase out coal as fast as uh, France phased out uh, oil in um, the 1970s. So in our work, we're really trying to build a bridge between the inside and the outside view. And one of the criticisms that we frequently get in doing this work is can we learn from the past? So the implication here is that, okay, past energy transitions were driven by economics and technological changes and future energy transitions will be driven by policy. And we've reflected quite a bit on this criticism and we have two insights on it. One is we are not the only ones to receive this criticism on the outside view. So this is a common criticism levied against the outside view. So Kahneman writes that the outside view is often rejected for relying on crude analogy from superficially similar instances. Um, the second thing that we, uh, the second conclusion that we came to is that this, this criticism often puzzled us because if you can't learn from the past, what can you learn from? What data do you take? And we realized that the inside and the outside view don't actually learn from the past versus the future, but they learn differently from the past. So the inside view formalizes observed relationships between variables to construct histories of the future, either desirable futures which meet climate targets and solve other sustainability challenge, or the outside or nightmarish scenarios. And the outside view identifies reference cases to evaluate the likelihood of different futures irregardless of their desirability or nightmarishness. Um, and at first glance, these two may seem very similar, but the key difference is in this uh, word observed. Um, okay, thank you, Alec. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking at the audience. The key difference is in this relationship observed. And um, what the inside do, the, the key uh, foundation of the inside view is to um, observe these formalized relationships and to, then to use those as um, building blocks to construct these formalized models. Whereas the outside view is open to the fact that there may be unobserved variables and unobserved relationships and tries to generalize from a class of reference cases. 
Now, so there is this tension between the inside and the outside view, but we can also ask ourselves, okay, well, does one predict the future better than the other? Does one give us a more realistic um, path to the future than the other? And Kahneman, in his work, he found that when both methods are applied with equal intelligence and skill, the outside view is much more likely to yield a realistic estimate. Now, of course, we need both views to understand the feasibility of climate mitigation, because in some ways, climate mitigation is clearly a unique challenge and we need, we clearly need the inside view to understand um, uh, aspects of feasibility. But Kahneman does offer us two warnings that I think are useful for our uh, discussion here today. One is that people are strongly biased in favor of the inside view as a serious attempt to come to grips with the complexities of the unique case at hand. And he finds this very troubling because he warns that when pessimistic opinions are suppressed, exchanges of views fail to perform a critical scientific function. And so in our, one of the, given this asymmetry, we were really happy with our, um, with this session to have both contributions from the inside and the outside view and both contributions which aim to develop the inside view and contributions which aim to develop the outside view. We're also really delighted to see skill in building the outside view through feasibility spaces. And I'd love to talk about all the presentations, but let me just highlight the skill in building the outside view that we'll see here today. And there's really this systematization of this class of reference cases, looking at their outcomes and characteristics and mapping it to the target case. So in Gregor Seminuk's presentation, his class of reference cases is economic development. Globally, he looks at energy use and GDP at different stages of economic development, and his target case is 1.5 scenarios globally and regionally. Uh, Adrian Odenweller looks at the introduction of emerging technologies, measures the emergence growth rate, and measures this against the target case. And finally, Vadim looks at the expansion of mature technologies at the national level, normalized to the system size, and measures their maximum growth rate, and the target case is 1.5 and 2 degree scenarios, both globally and regionally. So we're really excited about this development of formalizing the uh, outside view, which we see in the literature. And we're also really looking forward to um, all the presentations today, both uh, representatives from the inside view and the outside view. This is the list of all the presentations that we have. And uh, thank you so much, and we're looking for, forward to a really great dialogue. How to show these cards. Now, but Jessica, I think, Otherwise, you would have one minute, but because I gave you two more minutes, we have three minutes for the questions. Um. <laughs> well, we're catching up on time. <laughs> okay. Well, then, then we are um, thanking Jessica and asking uh, Shinehiro to come up. Hi. So your presentation will be now changed. You can click here. I think it is more convenient if I sit there. Um. Jessica, is it yours? No. Okay. But you can leave it for me. Yeah. And this is a. Okay, um, thanks everyone, and thanks Jessica and Alea and invited me to, to, to give you this opportunity to talk about it. And so I'm Shin Asayama from National Shin Institute of Environment Studies, Japan. So I am a social scientist, I'm not the mother, so um, I'm not very good at dealing with numbers. <laughs> and, and also, I'm a very new to this scenario analysis research. So my talk's a little bit, maybe like a little bit fluffy, and maybe you find not very useful, but uh, actually, Jessica has a, such a very nice, kind, like, you know, welcome to have outside of you to do the um, very um, important work on, on feasibility of assessments. Um, so my talk today is, is try to, so I'm now a little bit like working on and try to understand the public perception, public perception of feasibility and desirability of a scenario and produced by IAM with my, my colleagues over there. 
uh, another signature of Fujimori, actually. Um, and so I, I did a little bit like a literature review on, on the literature uh, about the, and the scenarios. And I find, I think they are quite inconsistent way of using the term of what means possibility, feasibility, and desirability. And I think there is some kind of the room for the improvement, how to use this, you know, have a conceptual and, and yeah, argument and uh, discussion about the feasibility. And then, so to begin with, the, I think we should first like, recognize the different purposes of uh, the long-term emission scenario, such as SSPs and RSVPs, and pray for, the, for this uh, research community uh, and also the uh, policy world. The first is more scientific world uh, purposes to try to serve as a as a basis for the like, long-term projection by climate models and uh, to understand the like, impacts and climate change. And this is also like, taken by, by IPCC. And, and, then, and basically, the purpose is try to you know, explore the wide range of possible futures um, as a function of different assumptions. And, and this kind of approach can be like, considered like an you know, uh, explorative scenario approach. And the other side of purpose of this emission scenario so is try to provide useful information and, and for policymakers, you know, and to how to achieve the, some of the political goals they they this, they agreed to to reach. And and this is also like you know, like input to the UNFCCCs and 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 basically these kinds of scenario approach is, as the purpose is, is to evaluate the impacts of project interventions and compare to the baseline assumption of current um, trends. And so, and also these kind of differences can be like, you know, also you can say that the, that the first one is more about aligning with the working group one approach in the IPCCs, and and second one is more about aligning with the working group three approaches. Um, but and also uh, to understand that also the uh, differences of scenarios, I think they, they, uh, we need to have sort of typology of scenarios. And there are many of the proposals and literature review about what kind of scenarios are there. Uh, I think the Loja of Perica have done also an excellent job about, about this. But uh, basically, uh, I would say uh, we, we would have like three different uh, broad category of scenarios. One is predictive scenarios, and explorative scenarios, and normative scenarios. And I'm basically, the, what the I, I am communities and the more, more I, and climate research communities are adapted for using this community scenario is exposure approaches and try to think about what can happen in the future and based on like some certain like you know, assumptions. On the other hand, what uh, the question of feasibility dealing with, and particularly the, what, what the policy world is interested in, is more about, about what kind of like in the future we can, uh, uh, how can be, uh, what kind, uh, how can be a specific target to, uh, to reach compared to with what will happen in, 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 uh, in assumptions of current trend. And so, then come down to the question about what means the possibilities, and I think it's a definition of scenarios in IAM communities. It's a little bit ambiguous because um, they claim it's basically they define a uh, scenario is as a possible description of how the future might develop as a based of as based on a coherent in, and inter in, internally consistent set of assumptions about the key relationships and driving forces. But without claiming of any like the probabilities of likelihood, and so from like according to these definitions, you could argue say the possibility is sort of like an internal consistency of storyline, but doesn't necessarily means it's, it means a like a you know, probability and likelihood. And then like when you we, when we look at the, for instance the possibility of the RCP 8.5 or SSP 5 8.5. There are like you know, assumptions, uh, like for instance, rapid expansion in coal use, and then this is fiercely criticized. I think that Robert Pierre has done is it is very unlikely in in terms of like plateau of the coal, global coal demand forecast. But maybe the, the moderators can um, defend themselves. They well, the, our definition possibility is not about the likelihood. It is about what the you know description of the future might look like. So it is internally consistent within the storyline. So we could say like it is possible scenarios. 
So, but again, like you know, the, the people use the term very differently. So that kind of creating the, like a little bit like you know, miscommunication. So we need to have a more you know clarified um, discussion about possibility. And yes, and then one of the way I think this is helpful is this the, this concepts uh, developed by the uh, Hancock and. Bezold and 1990. They are the, the researchers in the health uh, sciences, and they, they use uh, like, like you know the, this very simple diagram of future cons, and they classify the different futures for, for four categories. One is the possible future; it's what may happen. The the other one is possible futures, what could happen, and third one probable future is what will likely happen. And, and the fourth one is preferable, what we want to have happen. And I think, and basic, and it's, we, it is fair to say, like, you know, I am communities using the LCP and SSP scenario as try to like, explore a possible scenario as a possible, and why possible. Maybe like an LCP 8.5, consider a possible future, but not possible future, um, in terms of like, you know, um, the definitions. But I still, like you know, we could argue that this is uh, possible um, futures, um, and then of course, and then 1.5 two degree scenario is is a close, can be it is I can argue we consider it as a as a prefer, preferable futures. But what to think about the uh, feasibility of scenario? What is important is is uh, the, the probable futures, and then this is more aligned to the NDC scenarios. Um, and then, and there is a huge gap between, like, you know, what the world is heading, and then, and what is issue go. And then, I think the Roger Pierre has actually very nicely tried to point it out. This this gap is a probability gap vacuum, it creating that somehow a confusion about the, to understand the, and the scenarios and feasibility and possibility scenario uh, of scenarios. So I think. What we need to do first, and into assessing the feasibility of scenario, we need to look at the 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 that we need to see this this feasibility of scenario as a degree of difficulty or attainability in changing the course, uh, future course from baseline scenario, which is the probable scenario, uh, future, to the normative scenario, to the preferable future, and, and then important question is, of course, it is how to define the f base baseline. And it is also very contested, I, I will say. And, and, and again, like a scenario, like in communities, come up with different kinds of the baseline scenarios. One is no policies, baselines, current policies, current ambitions, and central mitigation scenarios. And so um, basically, uh, I think, and nowadays, I think particularly the IPCC working group three uh, adapted to more um, using like you know, current policy and current ambition and scenario as sort of the baseline scenario to think about uh, feasibility. And so we could like, have sort of more clarified uh, uh, debates about the feasibility is it can be defined a projection of most likely is, is uh, uh, no, the baseline scenario is the projection of most likely estimate of emission trajectory. Um, but uh, of course, it, it's important to it's difficult also uh, align to the, the consistent like, change of the current trends and to into the, you know, uh, constructing the uh, baseline scenario. So that is one of the challenges, I guess, it's a, a feasibility assessment of scenarios. But also we, we need to think about a more broader view about feasibility of scenarios. And I think the model is very good at like dealing with as, as geographical constraints and particularly also the technoeconomic feasibilities and that's those kind of the uh, factors can be quantified, but they are not very good at like dealing with uh, and socio-political feasibilities and, and such as institutional capacities and decision-making processes, public processes and so on and so on. So I, I, I think I want to suggest moderates not to uh, try to like, you know, quantify unquantifiable aspects of things, I think it's better to leave it outside the model and try to think about how we can like, you know, deal with this social political feasibility and, and outside of the model. Um, but also it's important to think about the feasibility is the inseparable link with feasibility to with desirabilities. Um, it is, and so it is very difficult to distinguish when we think about the social the political dimension of uh, feasibility 
when and de departed and separated from feasibility because after all, social acceptance is the fundamental norm of correct and concepts. And um, to look into deeper into the feasibility, actually somehow singling out as more socially desirable um, options. And then, and this comes to the question about the performativity, actually, the creating this and um, feasibility uh, scenarios. I think it's it's important to think about to look into actually the infeasible, but the feasible scenarios, because that kind of um, scenario can come into the political debate and post and, and policymakers' hands in some way to try to expanding the space of the political uh, possibilities. So I think it's it's we need to have good balance between the uh, finding to the feasibility scenarios, but at the same time also incorporating infeasible and desirable and scenarios. And so this is my last try. So um, so and also I think it's also important to think about scenarios not as just a product uh, to be just you know be used for the better describing the futures, but also it's a process of learning and from uh, making better decisions. Uh, so I think it's it's you know I think it's it's important to sit and putting like you know scenario feasibility assessment on a like like wider like in a context of learning from the scenario uh, yeah assessment yeah thank you. Yeah, so I'll open the floor for any questions. Adrian? Okay, hi, uh, Adrian from the Potsdam Institute. Um, so I'm wondering from a social science perspective, do you see any merit in trying to include sociopolitical feasibility also endogenously in scenarios, or would you say that should really be two separate things? How do you envisage such, a, such a, an interface to work? I mean, it is important to think, like look into the sociopolitical feasibility, but I, I, I don't think it's, 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 it's a wise approach to, to quantify the social political feasibility in, with, by the model approach, because that's not very, like you know, easy to, to quantify. So I, I, I mean, I, I led a couple of papers to try, try to do that, and IPCC tried to do that. I, I think this is very, very not very useful, and I, I think very better to like try to um, to approach more different approach. And and then I think, yeah, I mean, so I don't I don't think that's a, a mo yeah that's not a good approach. Just a copycat question. What would be your answer then for societal uh, desirability? Like how we can uh, integrate the models or should we? And I think the, so, well, assessing the feasibility and crafting the, the, the feasible scenario is I think the different things. And in, in one approach you could say, okay, we try to, do, you know, I, how to say, interview the different stakeholders and try to think that what they are think is feasible and put into the, you know, somehow, you know, the scenario storyline and maybe argue that this might be like considered the feasible like a scenario and then calculate and then you can evaluate the economic aspect of that. But on the other hand, you could also say, okay, and then, and just based on the technology, like an economic assess, uh, the aspect and you calculate it and then you show it and to the more wider audiences, then the, what do you think about this like an outcome? Is it, do you think it's feasible or not? Why do you, do you not think feasible? So, so I think the assessing feasibility and crafting feasibility is a bit the different things. And I think the both approaches has a benefit to do that. And um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we now at, are a at 15, 15 minutes, so, oh, there is a question. Okay, Olivier. I think Oliver I wanted to ask because I ask him, ask him a lot. <laughs> yeah, and always as the first one. It's, it's, <laughs> it made a joke, it's just like India. You end your talk and Shin already has the hand up. 
uh, the IPCC colleagues know what I mean by that. Um, so uh, I, I really like that you try to distinguish, and I think we have to do that, feasibility from desirability, because I think in the practical application of the feasibility framework, it often seems to be somehow assumed that these are the desirable options, but if you look at the uh, definition in the Working Group 3 SPM, it's just about a chance for an option to be deployed. Uh, and we wouldn't talk about climate change if it wouldn't be feasible to deploy a lot of undesirable options. And I think we can learn more about the system we live in uh, if we do that as well and distinguish. I have seen many articles about feasibility more in the adaptation space uh, where everything that is normatively desirable gets, let's say, somehow translated into a feasibility condition, where you might think, I'm not sure if I can say, because it is a inequitable or just or fair option or a way to deploy it, that it makes it more feasible. I mean, with that kind of mindset, I couldn't explain what's going on right now. So I think it's really, that there needs to be some conceptual work done uh, to, to make clearer what the, what the um, relationship is. And I think in many instances, it would be more interesting to, as you said, to, to not also to look at infeasible, desirable options, but also on feasible, undesirable options uh, to learn about the behavior of systems. So yeah. it was actually a comment, and you said yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think it's time's out, so I think it's better to yeah, discuss with you. I mean, yeah. well, not, not strictly in definition, but we will have time in discussion. It was a very useful contribution, though. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very and, uh, much. And Elena, please. So this is your answer. Mm -hmm. Jessica, do you want to take what you, your online yes. thing? Yes. No, yeah. no, no, not now. No, not now? Okay. Okay, I guess it uh, shows in the... <laughs> okay, now it's good. Um, uh, my name is Alina Brutchen, and um, today I will summarize uh, lessons learned from systematic evaluations of integrate assessment model scenarios from a feasibility perspective. Um, and my presentation is based on insights uh, from an article that was uh, published in Environmental Research Letters in 2021. Uh, with many co-authors, and but uh, I will also highlight some uh, insights from more recent uh, work together with uh, Silvia Pianta. Um, and overall, I guess I would like uh, to summarize three uh, three main lessons or three uh, main takeaways uh, by lo by uh, looking at scenarios. Um, so first of all, how are scenarios normally evaluated, and what is uh, the core of the approach? Um, so basically the core of different approaches uh, so far that have evaluated scenario is that we take the trajectories uh, from scenarios uh, and benchmark those uh, to other lines of evidence. And obviously there are super many options of what type of evidence uh, to use and we have also really see, uh, seen many different uh, approaches taken there. Uh, so, um, already traditionally, we have uh, quite many scenario evaluations where uh, trajectories from scenarios were compared to historical rates and experts' evaluations. Um, uh, we have heard about also the feasibility uh, space uh, based on work uh, by Jessica Jewell and Alec Terp and Vadim Vinichenko, where um, systematic patterns uh, from the past are used and compared uh, uh, to what we find in scenarios. Uh, then. Um, other scholars have compared scenarios also to uh, projections, uh, for example, from the in uh, International um, Energy Agency, uh, or um, in our work we have combined um, sort of different lines of evidence along uh, multiple indicators. And one could also, um, something that we are working also with uh, Sylvia, uh, in terms of uh, dietary changes, one could also use uh, projections along SSP um, based on econometric uh, models and kind of develop the ranges and see how, how scenarios compare to those. Um, and so the insights that I will summarize today are based on this um, combining different lines of evidence al along multiple indicators, so some sort of more uh, multi-dimensional uh, feasibility perspective. And the first lesson or the takeaway uh, from experience from evaluating many scenarios was again that we need to keep in mind 
uh, that scenario is, uh, is a system. And specifically, the type of the models that we are looking at are the so-called process-based integrated assessment models, um, which are prominently evaluated in the IPCC reports, such as message IX globium, remind make pi and which globium, and, and many more, just to give you uh, a few examples. Um, and they uh, represent the main systems that could be sources of things, uh, um, so sources or sinks of emissions. Um, and importantly, they normally represent three systems, so energy, land, and econ economy, uh, that are interconnected. And what we are most concerned about and what we uh, look at as first are the greenhouse uh, emissions, uh, such as CO2 emissions and methane emissions. And I think here is also more recent debate uh, that we should uh, look not only at CO2 emissions, but for example, really more at methane emissions and so on. But overall, uh, this gives us a, a very um, large amount of outputs and indicators uh, from the scenarios that we can look at on different um, uh, yeah, types of trajectories. And so to order this a little bit, uh, we proposed uh, five dimensions based on the past IPCC work. Uh, where we categorize some of the key indicators into um, geophysical, economic, technological, social, cultural, um, and institutional dimension, and then propose metrics um, sort of for each indicator, uh, for each dimension, and for which indicator, which allow um, a comparison across scenarios. And so, by using um, yeah this many indicators and by benchmarking them um, to different lines of evidence, we are kind of trying to, to find a more aggregated and sort of big picture view of uh, what is going on in the current uh, generation of scenarios. And important insight is because scenario is again a system is that uh, it's really important to take uh, into, into account uh, this because yeah, if we look at, along uh, different uh, multiple indicators and different uh, points in time, we'll find different types of trade-offs. Um, and so for example, one example, um, is that uh, we, uh, we see the trade-offs over time uh, and along the technologies that are used, that scenarios that, um, uh, for example, have uh, higher uh, usage of negative emissions and especially BECs that was getting quite a lot of attention recently later in the century, those then don't have such a drastic, uh, let's say, transformation early on uh, using more established technologies such as uh, solar and wind. So yeah, so we really have this, um, this type of trade-offs uh, as a, one of the patterns that we see across uh, many uh, scenarios in the current generation. But we also see trade-offs uh, over time. For example, uh, that if we compare scenarios within uh, the same uh, climate category, the, the ones where the mitigation uh, starts early on to those where mitigation is delayed, that we also see the, the trade-offs that of course with um, early, um, more drastic mitigation. We have uh, more visibility concerns early on, uh, but then uh, later in the century, we don't have uh, other visibility issues and other visibility concerns. So, and another uh, insight is that, uh, for example, with this uh, trade-offs, is that uh, we see that the so-called demand uh, side mitigation uh, measures are not yet uh, really uh, pushed to the limits, as we would argue. And of course, here uh, um, you also have uh, to think about what type of uh, thresholds you use um, and so on. But generally, we don't see so much going on there. And that, of course, also again could affect sort of the insights of the uh, overall feasibility and might help us maybe if we also take this into account in the future um, to find sort of overall more, um, more balanced portfolio with uh, with less visibility uh, risk. So again, here we also need to always take this into account, uh, the demand side, uh, and here we are uh, in alignment with the more recent calls that we should also try to incorporate behavioral changes and lifestyle changes um, uh, in, into the next generation uh, of scenarios. The second uh, main lesson is that it's also essential to understand uh, the overall patterns uh, and the key assumptions uh, in the models. So another key, um, key finding that we had 
and I think uh, somehow something is uh, off with the, <laughs> with the visualizations, uh, is that uh, we uh, see that uh, almost all scenarios uh, violate uh, what we call the so-called um, institutional feasibility uh, constraints. So there, uh, the way we did it was that we uh, uh, looked at the regional uh, CO2 emissions reductions uh, per capita per decade, um, and then um, kind of benchmark those to the institutional uh, capacity that regions um, uh, assume to have in a given decade. And what we found was yeah, that quite often mitigation uh, was happening in regions that have relatively low uh, mitigation capacity. Uh, but this is to a certain degree uh, not, uh, not surprising if we go back uh, to the to the core assumptions in the models, because the models are set up uh, to find the cost-effective uh, options. And so, for example, um, in the message model, uh, the objective uh, function of the core model is to minimize total discounted system cost, and therefore mitigation happens uh, in regions where it is the cheapest, and so this is why we find um, this violation of uh, from the institutional feasibility perspective. Um, and so the insight uh, from this is that um, I think this systematic evaluations of scenarios uh, can help us uh, to find some key patterns or inherent weaknesses uh, also within the models that we might want to address uh, in the next generation of the model, sort of in a more systematic way, uh, and to think about it, okay, is there uh, anything that, uh, that we can do to, uh, to address this weakness? Um, and so, for example, for I think for the institutional capacity, uh, since this is um, not really explicitly often uh, modeled um, or addressed in the models, so to address this weakness, we would need to think uh, of um, how to incorporate this, for example, um, uh, in the models. Uh, and I think this uh, sort of general um, insight that uh, capacity of different or uh, regional heterogeneity and capacity to uh, implement um, different mitigation um, strategies uh, is important, um, is really also at the core of the uh, of the feasibility uh, definition. So as uh, from the political philosophy perspective, uh, perspective um, yeah, outcome is uh, considered as politically feasible if the agents or group of agents have yeah, the capacity, uh, capacity to do so. Um, and for example, in our uh, more recent work, so the first uh, step that we uh, tried to move this forward was to think more systematically about capacity and also different types of capacity and what are the insights from political science that we have. Um, and we have identified uh, overall sort of uh, key, uh, key areas from political science, uh, the, the so-called uh, emissions lock-in, the this, uh, capabilities to implement certain things, uh, and then also public opinion. And to show that uh, one can uh, also operationalize this, we uh, proposed also uh, measures uh, for, for each of these different um, areas and, and uh, then aggregated uh, the most recent data into five integrated assessment regions um, just to show um, yeah, the, the current regional, uh, regional heterogeneity across these different um, types of capacity that might be important. Um, and as a next step, uh, we have also developed some ideas uh, of how we might try to bring those, uh, th those insights into integrated assessment models, um, and not necessarily by um, yeah, completely changing uh, sort of the structure of the models of, uh, or anything, uh, but just improving some of the current assumptions uh, in the models to be more aligned to uh, what we find from the political science uh, insights. Um, and so just to summarize the lessons, uh, first of all, scenarios present outputs of different combinations of mitigation options. And so to understand overall whether a pathway is feasible, we need to take into account developments along key mitigation levers and different points in time. Um, so systematic evaluations of scenarios and benchmarking those to different lines of evidence can help us identifying general areas of concerns and weaknesses in the current uh, set of scenarios and to think about uh, what we could do uh, and improve in the future. Um, and to take, I think, this institutional capacity a bit better into account, uh, we might need yeah, uh, a, new, uh, a new set uh, of scenarios. 
Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I see Gunnar was first and then Oliver. Thank you, very helpful. Um, I have a question regarding the IPCC scenarios and the assessment. You showed that I think demand side changes, it's largely blue, so that means it's uh, not such a big challenge um, compared to stuff like technological change. And I have a hard time squaring that with things like um, EU countries always notoriously failing on the efficiency targets so we all, and, and other things. We really, really have trouble getting people to a more low footprint lifestyle and these kind of things. So how, do, how does it fit together? Would you like me to directly react Good to this? Side. Okay, <laughs> thank you, yeah. So I think uh, here, because um, um, we, we evaluated, yeah, the current set of scenarios, and I think generally there are just uh, not so many scenarios uh, that are considered low energy demand scenarios, right? So we generally don't have like too many, uh, I, I think, in the current set that really push, uh, push these boundaries uh, and, and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hi, yes, Oliver. Again, uh, on the second last slide, you showed these uh, scores, the indicators for institutional capacity by in, in certain dimensions, but for IAM modeling regions. So now these uh, in these regions, there's, of course, a, a, a great heterogeneity of, let's say, political systems, uh, capacities. I'm just interested, in, I mean, these are probably averages, but averages of what, numbers of countries, and, and how they, did you deal with these, with this heterogeneity? What were basically the steps in between? Uh, probably a country analysis, because it can't be regional data to, mm -hmm. to modeling regions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here uh, we aggregated it uh, based, uh, weighted by population. So also to, to reflect kind of the size and the uh, importance of a country in the region. And here we present examples of five uh, regions, but I think uh, also in ER6, we now have actually 10, 10 regions, so a more granular resolution. And I think in our paper, we also argue that this is something that uh, is also essential to think about whether we can uh, have uh, even more regions or slightly uh, different regional clustering to take this into a, this uh, heterogeneity in capabilities a bit better into account. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk, uh, David Leclerc. I was wondering whether you considered or would consider in the future dimensions related to equity, for example, uh, is the burden sharing uh, fair across countries beyond pure economic? Uh, accounting of the costs, for example, and the benefits. Um, I guess it can play out in different directions. It could be that if uh, the distribution of efforts are fair, they might actually go against, let's say, established power relationships and would almost be less feasible from that perspective. But on the other hand, could go towards the broader SDG agenda and could be more feasible from that perspective. Or do you frame that in, in, mm -hmm. in your work? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think also the concept of justice and equity is also gaining really a lot on uh, prominent and discussions and I think we also heard from the IPCC uh, panel that th this is also a concern for countries um, and I think there we also again need uh, some first work to define uh, sort of also what do we mean by concept of justice and uh, what do we want to look at because I think we also want just to uh, go beyond uh, looking at emissions uh, again, there. So, but I think uh, generally we could also use uh, some similar tools to first explore scenarios systematically um, to see, okay, what is going on, for example, in terms of, um, yeah, if we compare different regions in terms of uh, emissions reductions, but then also scaling up certain technologies and so on. So I think we can also separate these discussions along this kind of different dimensions. Um, and then I think we can also then think about um, how to present it to policymakers for them to understand a bit better, because I think there will probably also be some trade-offs uh, also there, uh, how, how to think about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lina. Once again. Lord. Uh, and Roger, please. I, I lost my um, list of presentations for a second.
Well, I'll say good morning, because this is about when I wake up. Um, there's Boulder. Uh, I'm going to go fast. I'm not going uh, to talk about every slide. I want to leave some time for discussion, uh, both for my presentation and everybody. Um, this is an advertisement. Uh, if you want to know my broader views on climate, this is a wonderful gift for that special someone in your life. Um, I'm going to go quickly talk about um, a methodology that I and uh, Justin Ritchie and Matt Burgess, two close colleagues, uh, and have been working on for the last couple years um, to evaluate plausibility of IPCC scenarios. Um, let me say this is obviously not the only way to evaluate scenarios for plausibility, and it may not even be the best way, but it is a way, and we have uh, entered this discussion to try to motivate a broader discussion exactly like we're having here. So, so thanks to Alec and Jessica for uh, organizing this session. All right, you've seen this already, and I'm gonna show a lot of slides that is cone-shaped. And one of the key questions is, how can we tell the difference between a scenario that is possible and a scenario that is plausible? Um, the IPCC uuh, states explicitly that the scenarios it considers are plausible, but it does not give us uh, rigorous criteria for evaluating plausibility and does not itself take responsibility for doing that evaluation. Um, so that's a gap that needs to be filled in uh, the literature and in practice. Um, so, so here's an analogy. We're doing something very similar to what Working Group 1 has done with physical climate models. Uh, they have looked at constrained model output um, based on how well it replicates temperature changes in the past. Um, those that can't replicate past temperature changes, it sets aside when it has done its projections for the future. We're doing something very similar. So our approach, um, we have multiple different screens that we use to evaluate scenarios. Um, I'm only going to talk about a few of them. Um, but the, the key part is we have a screen that looks at the past. How well do scenarios uh, replicate emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel and industry? Um, and then we have a forward-looking screen where we take the most recent scenarios, short-term scenarios of the IEA, um, it was 2040, uh, now they're out to 2050, and we say how well do the scenarios match up with the uh, carbon dioxide emissions from uh, these projections. Um, we use multiple accuracy, accuracy thresholds for annual growth rates, um, and we've looked at the scenarios of the AR5, and I'll show you today for the first time the scenarios um, of the AR6. So, so this figure, um, this is one of my favorite figures um, that, that I've had a chance to develop. This shows all of the AR5 scenarios, uh, 1,300 scenarios plus. Um, they're arrayed uh, based on temperature change on the vertical axis in 2100 and cumulative carbon dioxide emissions on the horizontal axis. And I put the, the red oval around it. This is the entire set of plausible scenarios that AR5 had in its database. How do we know that IPCC considered them plausible? They put them in the database by definition. So after we apply our screen, and I'm just going to show one of them here. What does the red oval look like? The bottom figure shows the, the scenarios that survive our screening. Um, so these are the scenarios that match up according to a quantitative threshold with past emissions and projected emissions to 2040, in this case, of the IEA. Um, it's a much smaller subset. And we would expect this. This is perfectly natural because most of the scenarios in the AR5 database are based on information as of 2005 or 2010. Um, scenarios get old, just like me, just like you, um, and they need to be refreshed every once in a while. Um, so here's some key points. Um, the high emission scenarios are clearly implausible according to the screen. What's a high emission scenario? Um, anything over six watts per meter squared in this instance. Um, RCP 4.5 and the SSP2 4.5 are plausible high emission scenarios. I know in the literature they're often used to represent uh, mitigation success. Uh, today I think we can say based on this method that they are in fact uh, high end scenarios. Um, a, a business as usual or, or consistent with current policy scenario is a 3.4 watts per meter squared scenario. Um, I will say that scenario is almost never studied by anyone. All right, so um, you probably can't read this, but I, I want to make a few points here. One is um, on the upper left, it shows that the CMIP process, uh, 
both CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, prioritize the highest end scenario, the 8.5 watts per meter squared scenario. It is no surprise, based on that prioritization, this bottom table shows, the most mentioned scenarios in the IPCC report are 8.5 watts per meter squared. And I've just made the case to you that, that those scenarios are implausible. So most of our attention in the IPCC reports and the literature that it accurately reflects is on scenarios that are not plausible according to this screen. Um, this is problematic. It may be good for advancing scientific understandings of climate change, but for informing policymakers and the public, um, this has created a bias in the literature and in the assessment process. So here's the results from uh, AR5 on the left. So the purple um, shading shows um, the, where the screen winds up for 2100, and you can see it's um, the highest uh, there are constant 2019 emissions. The median scenario there gets to net zero around 2100. On the right is the same analysis for um, the AR6, and it's uh, qualitatively substantially the same. The median scenario gets to net zero uh, about 2100, and the upper boundary is about constant 2019. Um, you can see the, the 7.0 and 8.5 lines above that that are well outside the, the cone. Um, another way to show that same data, so these are all of our screens, um, but I've circled the one on the left, which is the, the, the one that I showed in the figure um, with the 1% tolerance and using the IEA steps um, projection, all of the, the scenarios are between two and three degrees. So that's not policy success, that's not Paris, and it's not 1.5 degrees, but it's not four degrees and it's not five degrees either. Um, and here's the results for, um, for the AR6. Again, between two and three degrees. One thing I'll point out, if you go all the way to the right and you look at the APS, the announced policy scenario of IEA, um, those are actually in, uh, AR6 below two degrees. So this tells us uh, that according to the assumptions made by the people who produce these scenarios, if we were to follow the announced policies um, that have been stated by governments around the world, we would be on track for under two degrees. So we have a roadmap in front of us for what needs to be done. Um, we don't need fanciful inventions of technologies that don't exist. Um, we need countries to follow their commitments. This is good news. Um, one troubling finding is that many of the scenarios in the AR6 database are already not plausible. Most of them because they don't faithfully replicate the past. So scenarios have been put in the database which may have uses in scientific research, but which do not faithfully replicate the observed history of the energy systems. Um, again, that's problematic for policy. Now let me just take a brief moment to explain why is it that we have so many implausible scenarios. Um, so this is a cone. All right, I got a green card, that's good. I play soccer, so that's... that's um, this is a cone that shows um, CO2 emissions uh, to 2045, and all I want you to do is take a look at the the, the bottom curves here, which are the energy um, scenarios from the various energy institutions like EIA, BP, Exxon, IEA. And what you can see is that this is pre-pandemic. They, uh, by mid-century, they will be falling out of the range of projected CO2 emissions um, in the entire AR5 data set. So that means that the scenarios uh, did not envision the future that we are actually approaching. One reason for that, Coal energy, you already heard a bit about this. Um, this is from my colleague Justin Ritchie from a paper he did with Hadi Della Tabati, and it shows again for the entire AR5 database, so each line represents a curve representing future coal consumption, um, every single scenario in that database uh, projected an increase in coal consumption. The stars and the red line show, um, in fact, the real world is going in a different direction. So the assumptions of uh, learning by doing and ever-increasing coal energy, eventually taking over our, our, our liquid fuels, replacing wind, replacing solar, replacing nuclear, apparently that is not uh, expected to happen anymore. That's good news. Uh, similar graph, this is per capita coal consumption, and 
the, the yellow or brown curve is SSP 5, 8.5. Um, compare that to the, the IEA projections from 2019. This is pre-pandemic. Um, the pandemic coal went down, it's come back up, but it will be very similar. When I say that uh, 8.5 uh, scenarios based on these emission trajectories are implausible, it's because that purple and black line are not the brown line. All right, so what? A few thoughts. Um, and then I'll wrap up. So, so scenarios are expected to be plausible. That's, that's not controversial. Um, however, implausible scenarios with no connection to the real world are prioritized and dominant in climate research and assessment. Um, no one has responsibility for evaluating scenarios for plausibility. Um, and I'll be provocative here, the, the needs and wants of the climate research community appear to overshadow the needs and wants of policy relevance. Um, and this is something uh, Justin and I documented in a 21,000 word paper. If you have insomnia or jet lag, it's good for that. Um, but I think that's also not particularly controversial. Um, right now, scenarios are, are widely and consequently misused by central banks in social cost of carbon uh, estimates. Um, and when extreme scenarios are used as business as usual in research and assessment. Um, our view of the climate future is arguably distorted today by scenarios more than being informed. And again, that's a problem. Let me end, I'm not gonna read this. Um, this is an optimistic observation. Um, if you were able to get into a time machine and go back to 2000 or 2005, and tell experts in the climate community where we would be in 2022 compared to where business as usual scenarios projected, it would be a very positive message and people would be actually quite happy to be where we're at today. Um, deep decarbonization is an enormous century long challenge, uh, but the world is much better positioned to do it uh, than we conventionally think. So a special thanks to Matt and Justin. There's a whole bunch of papers here. Um, I'll post these online later today. And thank you very much. Thank you. We have some time for questions. I see some, but I will a, a little bit use of a priority or privilege of, and, and I just want one, make one reflection which violate my own rule of no question is that that this inside and outside view is primarily distinguished by cognitive kind of differences. Right? People prefer inside view because well-constructed, detailed, clear scenarios, they seem more plausible. So if you paint a picture of more coal, cognitively it is accessible, right? And what is cognitively accessible? We assign very high probability because our brain is not very, very good for calculating, right? So here I just find, even though we use completely different messages, completely different terminology, I find that that, that illustrates the dangers of the inside view when you paint in huge details these very vivid but very implausible futures, right? Okay, now I take the questions. And there was three hands. I will start here. Thank you, that's a, a quite a refreshing presentation. <laughs> um, I mean, bearing in mind that you've used uh, other sources, which of course they're not perfect, so I don't know how controversial they are, but it's, um, I can see that the, the trend definitely downward on the energy emissions. Um, I'm just wondering, because there seems to be kind of a lot of, um, a bit of a panic, you know, in the, in the press and in some politicians about climate change, and if there's sort of almost a paralysis that's caused by this fear of, you know, an uncontrollable situation. If, uh, you know, if this view can actually provoke us more to just to take action and do the, do the necessary actions that are needed rather than worry too much about, yeah, I think that would be quite helpful. Yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of views here. One is that, that the, the role of scenarios and climate research is promotional in the sense that it's out there to try to get people to act in a certain way. Um, and there's another view that's out there that says that scientists should call things like they see them based on the best available evidence at the time. And figuring out the politics, you know, is somebody else's job that we should hire them for. I think there's a middle ground there. Um, I, I am concerned, and we've seen this in the pandemic and elsewhere, that when, um, as we say in Colorado, when scientists or politicians get a little forward on their skis, um, it can actually damage public trust. So I think um, my sense is when I, and I've had a chance to give you know, versions of this talk around the world, um, 
I, I don't get a response from people that says, oh, we don't have to do anything. I often get a response that's more positive that, oh, this might be, in fact, a more manageable challenge and it's not all doom and gloom. So it, it's, you know, the politics and the science, I think we have to be able to, to talk about them separately, but, you know, no, no view of trying to convince somebody of this, that, or the other uh, who's in this presentation. This is just what the data show. Gunnar Luder from the Potsdam Institute. Um, two questions. Um, you had these coal deployments. Yep. Um, and uh, did I understand correctly that these are baselines that you compared to the IEA CPS? Are you aware of the NPI um, and NDC type of scenarios where we also um, put in these existing policies and existing pledges? And then, like, would you expect the result to be different? Uh, second question. Well, let me, let me answer oh, that while well, yeah. well, I'm thinking about it, because well, I have jet lag. Um, there, there are, you know, one of the things to appreciate, and I mean, everybody knows this, is the scenarios forum. There are an enormous body of scenarios beyond the IPCC database, the NGFS scenarios now, and um, the, the EMF scenarios used in the US social cost of carbon. Um, you know, one good thing about this particular approach is people can pick whatever family of scenarios they want and plug it in. Um, I would be really interested to see how other scenarios conform, but the fact that, you know, today I showed you about 3,000 scenarios, um, and they all pretty much say the same thing. Um, I'd be surprised if there are scenarios that envision, for example, um, the, the decision by governments around the world to, to go back to coal, so. Those baselines are meant to be counterfactual, and I, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the second question, um, of course, like a scenario is so rich and has so many data points, it will always be wrong on some aspects. Um, how do you think, like, if you filter scenarios based on a very small window about things that might be right or wrong, how confident are you that this also tells you about the quality of the 2050 outcome? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I think about the scenarios truly like a cone. They're not predictive. It's an intellectual space for crafting ideas about policy. And what we've done here is, is we have been agnostic as to the judgments made by the scenario developers. We, we, we're not second guessing those. So if, if the scenario community believes that the, the cone, that purple cone that we came up with doesn't represent all plausible futures, then my response is, well, go back to the lab and draw up some, some other ones that we can include there. Obviously, I mean, this is one of my frustrations with climate research. Obviously, we know a lot more about 2030 today than we did in 2005. And you know, the, the one big criticism of this approach here is that there are a lot of plausible futures that are, probably don't show up here because we haven't updated our thinking. And so that cone is probably bigger. Um, than we've thought. But that's a problem with the lag time in producing scenarios. It shouldn't be every seven years, every 15 years. We need to figure out how do we take an approach like the IEA every year and the climate science community has to adapt to the energy modeling community, not the other way around, would be my view. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope we continue discussion during the discussion. Let's applaud. Clever questions and clever answers. And the next is Teresa. Please go ahead. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Teresa from uh, Denmark, uh, University of Aalborg. Um, I'm a political scientist. I'm very happy to be here to meet all these uh, other disciplines. Uh, and I'm a so coming to this scenario and modeling from a very different perspective. But actually, in this session, I feel really connected to a lot of the theories behind and the criticism behind the uh, modeling. So um, I hope you will uh, understand. I just have to see how can I make this one. It's like this. Yes, so I just wanted to say just where I'm coming from. So I'm actually coming from um, political philosophy. I have did my PhD on moral philosophy and moral responsibility for climate change. And I've been working hugely on institutional capacity. I edited a book together with Steve Rayner, who unfortunately died a few years ago. But when we tried to coin this concept about institutional capacity, and really about understanding why we fail um, on a global level because we have too little capacity. And also I've been working on how we can connect better the factual sciences with the normative sciences.
sciences, because obviously there is an ideal in uh, scientific fields that we should be um, there shouldn't be norms within it, but actually what I have argued is really that we cannot understand the climate field without both having factual and normative assumptions and theories uh, connected. Uh, I've recently been working on how to define transition pathways, actually to understand what is a transition, what is it do we need, and what I key, my key point is really that we need to look both into the uh, technical skills and the technical side, but we also need to look, look into what type of transition do we need to make in the political institutional environment, and then also on how we need to change on a behavioral level, but it's only one part of uh, more things. Yes. Um, but in this session, we need to talk about feasibility. And what I really want to ask the first question is, what type of feasibility are we discussing? And a few types have already been discussed. But I think it's really important that we take into account that what is this topic really about? It is this challenge, it is this emission gap. So when we talk about feasibility, it's not only a theoretical exercise or a scientific exercise, it's a question about finding out what is feasible in terms of making this gap less. Uh, and obviously, we can talk about it in a technical way. We can ask the engineers, do we have the technologies? Do we know what we have to do? And yes, unfortunately, they actually do say we know how to do it and we can do it uh, on time if we wanted to. We can also ask the economics, uh, is it economically feasible? Do we have the money? And fortunately, yes, uh, we do have the money on a global level. We have so much uh, wealth in our society, so we can, can afford it. So why are we not uh, eliminating this gap? And I think this is really, we need to look into the political feasibility. And it is really that uh, if we ask, are we politically feasible? Uh, the answer I would give is really that we are not uh, feasible at that level. And we see it in a, if we look into the current ways we are dealing with issues and we can do a lot of analysis of it, but normally we would say that if there's so much logic in climate politics and in climate science, we can see the challenges and obviously people and politics and political societies should respond to it. But what we see right now is that even when we have crises such as the coronavirus crisis or the Ukraine war, uh, from coming from a European perspective, these crises do not spark climate politics. So it's not that we are currently in a political environment where, where we have a system that can react to crises and then think rationally about how to manage these crises and then climate crisis on top of that. So, so my conclusion from being within this field for the last 10, 15 years is really that uh, we are dealing with a non-manageable problem. So it is really funny or really delight, uh, interesting to be here where there's been doing so much modeling and interesting academic discussion about how to optimize and making these modeling perfect. When I'm actually, if we look outside the world, we know we can actually see a political society or societies where the systems are incapable of managing these problems. And the whole thing is that we lack the responsibility and the global layer of institutions to deal with these issues. Um, yeah, and uh, what we really, from a so institutional and democratic theoretic perspective, need what we know, um, need what we need, is really to have a better and more well-functioning democratic governance regime. But again, we lack that. Uh, I have just, I'm finalizing the book called The Climate State. It's in Danish in the first uh, year. Uh, and it's really about how, how it should look like, how should, how should the state look like. But unfortunately, we do not have that type of state at the moment. Um, and, 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 uh, and on top of that, we are also applying the wrong policy designs that are unsuitable for managing climate change. And just uh, one example is really that we all the time prioritize, prioritize short-term economic benefits over these transitionary um, technology shifts. So I think when we talk about feasibility, we need to look out of the window and look into the uh, societal evidence and analysis and say, okay, uh, and actually I agree with the former, uh, one of the uh, earlier speakers, that all these data that is behind this uh, type of analysis is really not suitable for 
coming into a model. Um, so the challenge is really how do we then fix this where we have some a lot of uh, modeling, but at the same time a lot of evidence and knowledge about how unsuitable our society is for dealing with the findings within the scenarios. Uh, and I just want to say that all the efforts the IPPC communities and institutions have been doing for the last uh, at least 30 years, but also 50 years, is really there has been no impact. So again, we need to look out of the window and think about what we do within this room and other rooms as well. We may be very good at doing a lot of academic stuff and doing a lot of interesting things that we can have, make an uh, academic career out of. But if we want to solve the climate crisis or the, are interested in, in uh, mitigating the emission gap, then we should think, really re reconsider, are we providing the, the right tools for society? And I think, I just want to conclude actually that the whole post-war ways of, of, um, inter, uh, of trying to make the IPPC as a key institution of making these global governance systems have failed. Um, and we need to understand on a much deeper level that our lack of climate management is a malfunction that is not just one malfunction, it's a completely global governance collapse. There are so many issues we are incapable of dealing with, solving or uh, addressing. Uh, biodiversity is one of them, and uh, on a more larger scale is all these sustainable development goals. It's water scarcity, it's inequality, etc., etc. So, and the reason why I mentioned this is really just that we need to be more modest about how we deal with these issues. Instead of just continuing trying to make academic discussions, we need to think about really hardly why are we so incapable of dealing with these issues. And uh, one of the issues really that all the time the issue is accelerating. So we are not dealing with, a, a, like we are dealing with a moving target that all the time gets worse. And that's why I'm always kind of depressed in my work, because I think it's so hard that every year things are just getting worse. So it's not uh, like that normally you would hope for that things get better. But in this uh, case, we can just deal with, we, we're dealing with an issue that is accelerating. And the point is just, it's really, it's really, here is really just that, uh, yes, we can focus on the emission gap, but we also need to understand that the emission gap is tightly connected to an acceleration of our whole society. So if we want to address the climate issue, the emission gap issue, we also need to understand how we transist our whole society. And again, I guess my, my most best analysis is that it's, it's impossible. We cannot diverse all these tracks at once. Um, but what we can do is that we can, oh, is it, can I get back here? Yes, is that we can understand the reason of the failures. And one of the interesting thing is that uh, when I look into the IPC reports, I'm so puzzled about so many things. And one of the things is really that I can see that there has been a shift in the methodology and policy design over the last 30, uh, 30 years. Um, and um, again, I'm not a modelist, so I'm not, uh, but what I can see is really that the different ways of approaching the whole IPPC methodology and the policy design, the discourse about it, the words they're using, are a complete, a very much has changed over the last 30 years. Uh, and that's what I think, at least what I want to do, is to look into more details. Why have these shifted? Uh, I'm also looking for collaborators, uh, uh, if there's anybody interested in this, in really to understand why have these epistemic geographies changed? Who has contributed to it? Uh, what role do different research community plays in this shift? Uh, and also how can we then combine different methods uh, using both quantitative computer science in mapping these networks, but also doing having qualitative analysis of the policy discourse and the methodology design. 
Uh, and the way I think we may improve this methodology is really to enhance the factual basis. It's like where there was somebody talking about the coal prediction and the forecast, really to include that into the, uh, into the scenarios, but also to have a better understanding of the normative designs. When we predict the future, it's about what future do we want? Should it be an equal one? Should it be a democratic one? All these normative issues is completely lacking from your predictions, and I think that is really problematic because we are also shaping the future when we are uh, making these modeling. Uh, and also what I think is really also to understand what this research community, when I first entered this IPVC um, um, room uh, and also began studying the IPVC reports, I was really puzzled about the, that people was talking about the research community. Uh, and I'm trying to understand that it's kindly based here, but I think it's also to understand what is, what is this type of research community and also what role has different fossil fuel companies placed in shaping this policy design. As we all know, there's a lot of funding for research, also climate research, and also at the IPCC institutions are heavily influenced, but I think there's too little focus on what effect has it actually have on how IPCC um, is designing and thinking about policy, but and also the impact of the institutions. So I want to conclude uh, that um, I want to argue that instead of optimizing and improving the methodology, we actually need to look at, uh, at uh, different things. We need to look at the normative purpose. What do we actually want? It's about saying, okay, we want actually to communicate climate science to somebody that should act upon it. And then we should think about, like uh, Roger has talked about with this, with the honest broker, and instead of us go into that and say, okay, how do we actually broker this, um, these, or bridge these two areas? I think the ABC models are doing it quite badly in the right now. Uh, and I think also we should investigate better um, how we make these useful guiding as a communicative tool um, and my, if I want to conclude is that this may, but I think it's very with a low probability, that it may change the emission tracks, so, but I'm actually not that hopeful. But what we can hope for is really that the IPCC report gets more readable, because when I read the reports, I'm quite shocked how they have developed in a bad way the last 30 years. They're getting less readable. They are 40, as nobody can read 40 pages, they are completely opaque and non-guiding. <laughs> so I think <laughs> as a communicative tool, we need to rethink the whole method of writing these gigantic reports nobody can understand. Thank you. Yeah, well, it clearly echoes many messages that I heard elsewhere in the scenario forum. Uh, and I think the gentleman over there is first, and then, then you. Thank you. Um, Felix Schenow, German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, first question, maybe, what is climate management, or what do you understand as climate management? Is it mitigation, adaptation? Um, and the qu second question, then, is, you mentioned that we don't have the capacity to manage the climate or, or to solve the problem we see. Where should the cap capacity come from? Is it really the IPCC that can create this capacity or is it maybe another problem that we have and it's not the IPCC? So first question, uh, when I talk about climate management, I mean both mitigation and adaptation from an institutional capacity perspective. Uh, it's not so important to distinguish because it requires the same type of capacity to do other mitigation and adaptation. And at, at the moment where we are now, adaptation is certainly needed anyways. So, um, so both of them. And the other question is really not, no, um, the capacity issue is really not so, the only issue is not about the IPCC, it's really about the European Union, the lack of UN leadership. It's really about that we have no global uh, political institution that can deal with, deal with these issues. And then the IPCC institutions were an invention that was supposed to try to make these translation between science into politics, but has so far failed. Uh, so no, IPCC is just one example of one global institutions that are very uh, unsuccessful. Um, Great, um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, so you, 
this is a little bit like off the topic your uh, talk, but I, I, I like, I want to pick up the, you mentioned about Steve Lehner in the beginning of your talk, yes. and then I think Steve Lehner and I think Roger Pierke also involved this, they proposed, like, they wrote the, the influential report, like hardware approach um, paper. And they basically, they argue that climate change is a wicked, wicked problem. Mm. So what we need to have as a politically durable uh, policy is not like an elegant policy that's uh, exactly. more or less, like, you know, constructed, like, like, like uniform global, like a carbon tax, which is, of course, all models know it is an artificial construct. It's never like, you know, politically feasible to, to implement. And other than, so instead of like an elegant policies, we need to have more like kind of clumsy solution that like, you know, looks like you know, clumsy, but it is politically durable, then across like political spectrums, so that can be providing more concrete and uh, political solutions. So do you have any minds like what kind of clumsy, pollutions, uh, clumsy solutions you, you can suggest for this? And yeah, for, yeah, increasing political feasibility. Thank you. So, so no, I don't have any uh, examples, but I completely agree with you that this idea of perfe perfectionizing and optimizing is really what he uh, or they criticize and saying we shouldn't look for that perfect modeling. We should look for the yeah the messy world and then try to uh, deal with that. Um, but no, I don't have any <laughs> clear answers to that. Hi, um, Charlie Wilson from the University of Oxford. Um, there's a oft oft-repeated quote from Winston Churchill that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And if I was to take your kind of diagnosis of our lack of capacity to manage climate change, I would apply it to the Paris Agreement and that you might say the Paris Agreement is the worst form of global climate governance. Mm. But is it also the, the, the worst form except for all the others? Like if, if, the, if the path to get to what you seem to imply to be this very sort of desirable global government type arrangement is so also problematic um, and, and maybe impossible, then maybe we're working with the best that we can get. Um, the problem is really when you go into so research about democracies, then is that they are on a so declining term, so to say. So we're getting less democracies and they are getting less uh, strong and meaning that what we get now is not really a discussion about whether democracies are good at doing something. We are facing a situation where we have too little democracy to actually deal with the issues. Um, so when, when, when people met in Paris to make the Paris Agreement, it was not a democratic or a, a climate political um, event. It was much more about political greenwashing where nobody actually wanted to do climate politics. They didn't want to close the emission gap and, and they have given up the, uh, making these globally legally binding agreements. And then instead they f found out that they could make these nationally determined targets, which nobody is um, applying to. So my point is really that we need to understand that what a lot of things goes on now is really political greenwashing rather than where we can um, estimate whether democracy or what we have is a lesser evil. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, I had more questions, but I think we should finish now and go for a break. And I, I have some ideas of how to, you know, we can have more discussion during our discussion. Before we go for the break, um, I say that despite all the efforts, we are one presentation behind. You know, we had to complete six and we completed five, right? Uh, so that if you could come, maybe we should say five minutes earlier from the break, right? So that we start absolutely promptly at least, or even maybe a bit earlier. And I also very much encourage you to come after the break to the second part because we have many interesting presentations which continue some of the themes started here in the first part. So, see you soon. And, and the, the plenary starts at, uh, again at uh, 18.15 in this room, so we will end on time. You might have heard Yeah. Am I the first to go after the break? No. Welcome back. We are continuing and uh, the same rules as from the first part apply. We will have slight change of, of the order by um, somebody presenting by Zoom, by Greg, Gregor Semenyuk. He will present after Oliver, otherwise we keep the same order. All right, uh, thank you very much for everybody who's already here, including Greg, thank you. Um, 
This is uh, a collaborative work and it's work in progress. Uh, it's from a team at the German Institute for International Security Affairs, uh, also including Felix uh, and Miranda, who are also here, uh, on assessing political feasibility frontiers, uh, but in a specific case, the case of a CDR, carbon dioxide removal, uh, in the European Union. Uh, what's interesting about that is that in the broader CDR debate, feasibility was always uh, one uh, of the major strands of that debate, uh, usually a critical one. Um, uh, on, on the right, it's of course hard to, hard to read, is the, uh, the section on the uh, Working Group 3 uh, Summary for Policymakers that speaks to feasibility, the report itself of CDR. Uh, I, I, I drafted and negotiated that uh, summary for policymakers part, but also in recent uh, high-level policy document, these are G7 declarations uh, from the uh, climate and energy ministers, and, um, and, and the tiny bit is from the science ministers, also raises feasibility concerns, uh, usually not on the political side. And we are focusing on, um, on, political, um, on political or institutional uh, Feasibility. It's also interesting that now, uh, whereas we have only talked about it as modeling artifacts, uh, increasingly talk about uh, carbon dioxide removal um, deployment. And I want to remind you, of course, probably not that many of you have been uh, at Denver four years ago at the Scenarios Forum, but there, the, what, what here is the Low Schaefer paper, was already a discussion on CDR feasibility with the interesting uh, outcome that this was at the core not even about feasibility but questioning the authority uh, of IAM modelers in how they modeled uh, CDR. I can, I can highly recommend that. Uh, political constraints and enablers are usually underrepresented in that area. Um, and we think that it cannot be meaningfully explored for the case of CDR, but maybe also for others um, at a global level. Uh, so these uh, uh, dual chap questions, uh, visibility of what, when, and where, and for whom can meaningfully uh, only answered uh, on a national level, maybe in the special case of the European Union as a genuinely supranational and intergovernmental organization. Uh, also at the EU level, so it requires a uh, focus on concrete CDR options and strategies, uh, and you can look at it at different actual levels. Of course, you could do it for OECD countries, single OECD countries, uh, BRIC countries as well, and of course, there is some element uh, or some potential then to aggregate that knowledge, what we learn about feasibility, political feasibility, uh, in these big emitting countries uh, who are also often in models, at least if we would say take the G20, uh, are assumed uh, to do a lot of it. Uh, what we do in our projects is a bottom-up assessment of political feasibility or infeasibility and of such frontiers, to, to borrow another word uh, from Jessica and Alech, uh, for CDR in the context uh, of the European Union. Uh, this is part of two very big funding lines in Germany on, on ocean-based and land-based CDR, and we are part of the synthesis project, and the synthesis project is doing feasibility assessment across the classical uh, six dimensions uh, we have there. Uh, and we will be trying to do a combination of assessing methods and pathways. Uh, in the uh, presentation that Elena gave, it was the pathway focus in the IPCC AR6 assessment a little bit more prominent. It's a methods focus. I would say you have to combine uh, both. The methods focus was more important in the, or more prominent uh, in the IPCC AR6 approach, but almost completely decontextualized. It was just a method. What would be the political institutional feasibility of a certain mitigation option, or the geophysical one, or environmental. I would say that was, as Jim is not here now, close to useless, really. I mean, uh, w what does it mean? The political feasibility of nuclear as such is a little bit hard um, to assess. So therefore, we think you need to do that not only on a certain actor level, maybe looking at certain methods of options, but also pathways of deployment, because scale uh, and location obviously um, 
will matter. Our starting point is trajectories uh, and, and targets in Germany and EU, if we have them, or process tracing towards uh, agreement about these trajectories. That, in a way, uh, refers to the what question. I mean, we would need to decide feasibility of what exactly, either it's the target or trajectories that, um, that governments set themselves, or what we have here at the later stage, uh, an analysis that is focusing on the expected contribution of the EU in the, uh, in the uh, context of, of global mitigation scenarios. And in the EU, the only thing we have right now, at least for the long term, is what we see on the right uh, in the picture, in the figure, uh, that we recreated from an official EU Commission uh, figure that's at the point of net zero GHG residual emissions and removals. And you see uh, below the zero line, it's just two colors of red, so very coarse categories. But more, there isn't more there for 2050. There are removals in the LULUCF sector. Uh, these are quantified. At these, we could look at. Uh, the European Union is quite good at that, but there's not more to it. Usually you just have a net zero target, but nobody talks about the assumed levels of, emi of residual emissions um, and CDR. And uh, which are the ways we're going to do this? Uh, uh, as, as I said, it's, it's work in progress. Uh, we, just, we just started, but part of, uh, of larger uh, consortia. Um, so in our projects, uh, if, we, if we look at that uh, uh, very influential uh, Trudner-Wittner paper from 2019, uh, it's more about a bridging strategy for now. So that's what we have uh, uh, at the bottom. So it's, it's more you work in parallel strands. We have modeling in, uh, in, these, uh, in these funding lines. Uh, I am modeling, and I would say, for now, because it was not set up in a, in a different way from the beginning, uh, as it so often happens in projects, uh, it will be parallel approaches informing each other, and the outcome. Well, let's let's see. Uh, one of the models is also here, uh, and as you know, in projects, uh, some of the pragmatic decisions get made um, quite late, um, and we use classical social science and political science methods, starting from. Uh, process tracing, interviews, document analysis. Qualitative foresight methods, they are in, they're important, especially in the, in the realm of marine carbon dioxide removal options beyond uh, blue carbon management, so ocean uh, alkalinity enhancement, ocean iron fertilization, or even more esoteric stuff like artificial upwelling. There's not even a political debate on this, so you would really need to do, and there's not much modeling, or at least in, in uh, mitigation pathways modeling. So there we aim to do uh, foresight scenario workshops uh, with, uh, with yeah, a set of relevant uh, actors. Let's not call them uh, stakeholders. We are a little bit critical about the usual way of doing stakeholder. Um, engagement. Uh, we also will do a political feasibility workshop where we'll exactly do what uh, we had in the conversation with, uh, with Shin, not only talking about the desirable uh, ways to do it, but also about feasible pathways towards deployment that might be completely undesirable, because we might have actors who want to do that. So it's interesting, at least, um, to learn about that. Um, what we also do, because we are social scientists, uh, we will go beyond what is often the dominant way of looking at policy making processes uh, in the modeling world about that notion of comprehensive policy policy rationality uh, including on, on on categories that are that are quite relevant in global modeling but also in european modeling like fairness or cost effectiveness and have a strong focus on politics and also on polity polity in the european union case means you have certain pillars of climate policy with different sets of rules, with different target regimes, with different ways how member states are relevant versus European uh, harmonization. Uh, things that we wouldn't expect modelers to know because, I mean, there's uh, for good reasons division of labor, but which often don't show up in, uh, in let's say, in the way uh, modeling studies talk about um, talk about the policy world. 
And as a next step, and we're already working on that, uh, Felix, uh, also Elena, is involved in another project proposal, uh, try to go for an iterating strategy where we have some of these elements already embedded in the way uh, the modeling would be done. And I think one challenge uh, why it is really hard and probably not very um, desirable uh, to really try to quantify political and institutional considerations into modeling is, uh, as one modeler we once asked, okay, but what governance theory should I apply if I should put that into our model? Because there is no strong paradigm in the social sciences, uh, and how would you actually do that across modeling teams? You would need to decide uh, how do I think that the policy-making world uh, actually works. Uh, I, I don't see a way doing that. We had that in the regions as well with different political cultures and systems. And that's already it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much. Right here. So I, uh, I, I think that the uh, ideas that you're raising are critical and to get governance into uh, informing um, the, uh, the modeling uh, structures. Um, uh, it, it touches on some conversations I've been having here, so I'm just gonna ask you one, just to, just to you know, try it out, um, which is if there were a major shift in attitudes towards consumption. Um, this is, this is, and, and so therefore the uh, things that were not politically feasible now would become politically feasible. Um, can, I, I guess I would say I, I am sensing some resistance uh, to changing models in order to take that sort of thing into account and what kind of evidence could be brought to bear, or I mean, if, if you even think it's plausible, what kind of evidence could be brought to bear to inform such a, such a question? And if that's not clear, that's because I'm in the middle of these conversations and just tell me to rephrase. Well, I would think that it is something that you can capture with, uh, with qualitative scenarios first and narratives about the future, how these things might change and might be influenced through regulation or not. I mean, I very much like what, what Chapter 5 in, in Working Group 3 did, saying lifestyle change is not just about the individual decisions. There need to be the proper infrastructures for that. So I think it would be easier to imagine political decisions through which these changes in towards sustainable consumption would be enabled because I guess I would not think that that will fall, that a change in patterns would fall um, uh, uh, from heaven. And, and then I think you could simply uh, have built in certain constraints or remove constraints you have because you think that's not going to happen anyway. I mean, that's a beauty, I think, of the feasibility concept working with the logic of barriers enablers. Because in the early CDR discussion, I was one of those who said, well, it's just not feasible, uh, end of the story. So now you would have at least have to say, okay, what would be the enabling conditions to make it feasible, and then maybe why this is not plausible, or under which conditions would it become plausible? I think you now need to put a little bit more uh, intellectual effort in that, and yeah, it can shift over time. Fascinating, very, very interesting. Other questions? Okay. You like competed. I think I think you should go because you like never you. got to ask a question. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I'm just wondering about the definition of political feasibility. I think it's very difficult to define what it is. I think it's, the way I see it is it's somewhere between, uh, if you push, if you're pushing too hard, you get a push back from society, they won't accept it because it's too much. And on the other hand, if you're not going fast enough, there are some parts of society that will push to you to, if you're a policymaker, like, come on. So then it becomes politically infeasible to not do enough. So there's a kind of constant balancing. I think there's also the, um, and of course that's different in an authoritarian type of government compared to a, a democracy. So um, 
um, I just wondered if it, if the, it requires a kind of really fluid, um, um, responsive kind of way of thinking about it, rather than thinking about it as a, a linear or anything like that. It's a relational thing rather than being a, a measured thing. Yeah, I mean, for, for social scientists, everything is a relational thing, uh, and of course it can change over time. I think one problem with the feasibility concept, as has as had been established in uh, SR 1.5, is that it is a concept without much of a theory. Suddenly these categories were there, and political is not even explicit, so you have institutional, you have social, cultural, I have never seen an article discussing even the labels of these, so I think it's also an attempt, and others should do that as well, but in the, in the German CDR funding lines, we are kind of forced to do that. Now, it, apply these empirically, and then also bring that back on a meta level and say, well, we think that concept doesn't work for this or this reason, or here we need more fluidity or, 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 or potential for change, uh, and how do these six categories really uh, interrelate. I think we were really at the beginning and uh, in AR6 I would say, yeah, they, we, I was not directly involved in that. We, um, we went on what was done in, two, in, in 2018 in the synthesis report, but still I, I know that now some kind of perspective article will appear, but um, I wouldn't put too much hopes into it, uh, bringing then the debate forward. I think if we apply, try to apply, that we might find out that many things aren't as easy uh, and, 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 and you get in more complexities. Of course, you cannot, let's say, get all these complexities then later in models or assessment frameworks. But I was always bothered with that political, as a, even as a, as, a, as a term, does not really show up uh, in these boxes, as if somebody had avoided it, what I don't know, one would need to go back to the authors of SR 1.5. Oh. But usually they say, well, we don't know why we chose this. It was a last minute decision. I, I don't know in this, in, in this uh, sometimes I say that for AR6. Uh, it was not, it, uh, I, I never tried that. So I, let, let, I would say we're now in the, in the phase of exploring, okay, is it really a useful concept or what need to be changed, but I find it it marks progress against this, oh well, it's not feasible, and end of the story. So barriers and enablers is, uh, is important. I, yeah, I, I, must, I must intervene here that I am not connected to IPCC, and I always found it completely puzzling where these six things come from, <laughs> because there is absolutely no scientific foundation to why there are six and not 35 and not two, and why there is no political, but there is social, cultural, and what, what are these, right? And very often, like, you know, in my research on energy security before I found this, that in some kind of institutional report, somebody would like to categorize something, you know, in boxes, and it shouldn't be too many for policy makers, and then it becomes a big science out of it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so here, sorry. Thanks, Oba. Um I'm, I'm not asking because of you. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, just wondering about, like, so you, you said the use of Germany in Europe as a sort of like you know, the case for the, like you know, exploring the political institutions feasibility of CDL. But as, I'm wondering about because Europe and it's a bit unique cases some way because of the dual like you know like a governance systems of the European unions and and in Germany yeah. so I'm just wondering about like particularly thinking about CDL governance what the major like member states uh, like the government ha can deliver or cannot deliver and what the EU commissions perhaps can and, and, and do that I mean I think there's a lot of debates about it so I, I'm, I'm curious about like how these two institutions interacting and what this interaction is affecting about the affecting to institutional yeah, feasibility. Thanks. I mean, it's interesting in that way that uh, in the European Union, uh, climate policy or broader environmental policy, as defined by primarily primary EU law, uh, is is so in the area of European common policy making. So there, there are other areas like forestry policy, which are more in the realm of. Uh, of the member states. So you cannot usefully um, look at German climate policy or certain aspects of it. I think in adaptation it might work, but not in mitigation, uh, and not look at the European Union level. It just does not make any sense. Uh, of course, the ministry asked us about Germany, which said, 
We have to do that in the context of the European Union, and the major initiatives now are at the European Union level. If we would only look at Germany, you would see them doing something or see them waiting for something, but the major actor right now is the European Commission. Later, it will be member states who develop actual interests in that area. Sweden now being at the forefront, knowing quite exactly what they want. The UK was the front runner, but it's not in the EU anymore. It just shows, or the European Commission is making um, like suggestions that you would not understand if you would not know about their policy structure, how to organize climate policy in how many pillars what they want to shift. So they're using CDR as a new object to change things that are not related to CDR. And I think everything, all these elements need to come in there. It's never about uh, CDR only, it's never about climate policy only, but so about so many other things and, and that we aim to see and capture in analyzing this. Thank you so much, Oliver. Super, super interesting. So now we're going to have, um, yeah, another round of applause. So now we have uh, Gregor Seminuk online. Excellent. Um, Gregor, are you with us? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. And you're also larger <laughs> than life. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, so sad not to be there. Um, I've got COVID and I can't come. Very sad to miss you all in person, but um, thanks Jessica and Ale for a last minute um, uh, enabling me to, to present online at least. Um, so I'll present about plausible energy demand patterns in the growing global economy with climate policy. Um, the talk is based on a paper that's already published. Um, so if Jessica and Ali stop me, you can read on here. Um, I want to say that the title was actually initially feasible, not plausible, but one of the reviewers suggested to change it to plausible. And I'd also plan to do some more preliminary calculations based on the recent report. This paper is based on the 1.5 degrees Celsius report, uh, which um, COVID in the end prevented me from making it to a nice graph, but I have some results <clears throat> that I'll just share man <clears throat> verbally. So the bigger question of this um, that I think this paper fits into is, you know, what's feasible in other dimensions given IAM scenario assumptions about economic growth? And um, I came to the integrated assessment modeling um, as an outsider um, in Jessica's sense. Um, from economic growth theory and, and questions of, you know, just how do countries actually manage to grow? It's really hard. Um, so uh, that's what really motivates my research here. And, um, you know, IAMs by and large tend to show very ambitious economic growth paths in low and middle income countries. Um, and then in policy scenarios, um, they also show highly ambitious energy demand reductions in these same regions. So of course, one of the main pillars of mitigation. But history shows with few, if any exceptions, that the way this economic growth is achieved is by a shift from agriculture to industry, also known as industrialization. And that requires vast absolute increases in energy throughput, okay? I am for per se that you know they uh, they do not really engage with this question of you know the quality of economic growth. Um, it's actually the underlying economic growth models that that just are correlations of certain inputs and outputs, and that do not really explain what you know activity is really underpinning um, economic growth. And if I may say from uh, reading uh, in the literature, I see that there's a lot of discussion about consumption patterns and you know, changing what consumers do, do, but I see a lot less analysis of processes of production, um, of decarbonization of industry. Perhaps this is coming more to the fore. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> so I'm talking about the, the question of the feasibility of the simultaneous ambitious economic growth in these particular regions in developing countries. 
and um, the mitigation strategy of uh, decreasing um, energy demand relative to a baseline scenario. And um, in this paper, we do two things. Um, first, we basically substantiate with my co-authors, whom I didn't say, um, Lance Taylor, Armin Rezai, who's also based in uh, near Luxembourg, and uh, Duncan Foley. Um, we first look at historical patterns. And you know this is just to substantiate the point that I just made, economic growth over the relevant range, you know, not very rich countries, and also not certain outliers uh, that are some island states that perhaps have an oil refinery um, and, uh, <clears throat> or periods of war. But over long periods and um, over this range of income, you see here basically all countries of the world from 1950 or whenever they started existing um, have a very strong positive correlation between economic activity per person, GDP per capita on the x-axis, and uh, here primary energy per person on the y-axis. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, we can also look at the global uh, level, uh, not level, but um, uh, growth patterns. Um, so this is now global GDP um, per capita and uh, global primary energy per capita. And I'm using these intensities coming from this economics background, right? I'm interested in income per person. I'm interested in the energy uh, person ratio or energy per person, um, which is uh, common use, commonly used in, in growth models, similar to a capital labor ratio or so, um, about which economists have thought for a long time how these patterns might hang together. So here you see that when one of these indicators is growing faster, the other tends to grow faster too. Now it's not a mechanical correlation. You can see that in the so-called golden age of capital, uh, you know, the two grew almost on average uh, at the same level, at the same rate, sorry. And then we have what Angus Madison called the slow period uh, towards the end of the century, since the oil crises were both dropped, but of course energy, primary energy, dropped much faster and then both recovered. Well, there's more of a gap, but there's a positive correlation between the two. Um, so um, what do IAMs um, make of this history? Well, here you see the one graph from the paper about uh, future um, scenarios um, and my attempt to compare them with historical patterns. And with an extrapolation of these historical patterns, which you see in red based on the correlations of different historical periods, um, starting in the year uh, here 2018, which is what I had data on when this was uh, going to press. Um, but basically all these gray spaghettis and those blue lines are that 1.5 degree scenarios from the um, uh, 1.5 degree Celsius, uh, uh, report from 2018. And you can see here for the world that there's a pretty abrupt change uh, in the energy dimension, but not so much in the economic growth dimension, as you all know. What is perhaps more surprising is, whoops, that also for its poorest region um, on average, uh, or for the world's poorest regions in income per capita terms, this relationship is essentially the same. So the qualitative differences are not really there. Now, basically what we have in this set of scenarios and from my first glance at the AR6, um, where we can even look at 10 regions, um, there are, the conclusion still holds for me at this point, it's preliminary that there's similar demand reductions in all regions of the world with simultaneously a fast economic growth rate, right? And, that this is uh, optimist uh, to assume that this is feasible given our knowledge about historical growth. The growth strategy is left unexplained. On the contrary, all the models that are in the IPCC or nearly all of them actually have a growth model embedded in them. I mean, either they just assume growth exogenously or they have a growth model embedded in them that assumes that lower income regions will grow faster by assumption. That's called convergence in economics. 
So, so we, we do not know how growth works. And this also leads me to um, next steps, which I think would be great to, to talk to others in this room about if I was there, but maybe over email. You know, um, from an outside view that uh, Jessica so aptly um, um, brought up, um, one could go into much more detail about what possible um, lower bounds are there for energy demand from a fast industrialization strategy, for instance. What does that actually mean for energy demand? Um, because that could actually also inform perhaps uh, scenarios um, you know, that, that justified will say, well, you know, but so how much energy is needed? You cannot say. So from this production point of view, one could perhaps look into uh, past industrialization experiences. And from an inside view, um, of course, one thing um, would be to, to actually count uh, or, or model where industry is located in these future worlds, which I don't think is really done very much, um, with the exception perhaps of some CGE models. Um, and, and then whether this industry would be located in these industrializing economies, potentially, sorry, in these fast growing economies, potentially also raising questions about the assumed growth rates. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Any questions? Kunar. Short interrogative statement followed by a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a comment, but I make it short. Um, I, uh, very useful, I think. Uh, I wonder, uh, could you do the same thing for final energy? Because that's more related to the actual welfare. And we just need to take into account that if you electrify, if you switch from coal to solar, then you just create this very same amount of useful energy service much, with much less energy. So I think we really have to look at yeah, this final point of what the models have. And then, um, and you might still find a similar thing, but it, it will be more meaningful. Um, so sorry, I stress primary energy because I'm painfully aware of what you said for the historical data, but the plot that compares historical with um, scenario that is actually for final energy. So this is already the final energy dimension. And now you will say, well, but what about useful energy? Yeah, that's another frontier I think that we should all make more progress on. Um, but yeah, I showed you a graph for final energy in which this is looking similar, where final energy per person is dropping in many scenarios in the current decade for a region like the Middle East and Africa. And even for only Africa, although not for all, there's also some growth. Uh, it's a bit more mixed, although at very much lower levels, of course. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gregor. I think we'll move on to the next presentation to stay. Um... All right. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll keep listening. Vadim? Okay, hello. So, oh no, I have it. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Stop. Reset. Start. Hello. In this talk, I'm going to use historical experience of the growth of three major low-carbon electricity technologies, solar, wind, and nuclear power, to build an outside view on the feasibility of the growth of the same technologies in climate mitigation scenarios. And I will start by showing how we measure historical technology growth rates, then how we build feasibility space based on these rates, how we use this feasibility space to evaluate scenarios. Uh, then I will provide some cross-technology comparisons. I will come up with some broad observation on low carbon electricity as a whole, and then I will offer some conclusions. So let's start with measuring historical rates. And in this work, we are using the method we described in our article published last year. Uh, and at this, but we are bringing in some new data and new technologies. And at the center of this method, there are growth models. And we use several of them for robustness, but they all agree that the technology expansion starts with a period of accelerating growth, which eventually switches to a quasi-linear growth stage. And then it starts slowing down after the inflection point. So, if we feed a growth model to, for example, electricity generation data, 
And we see that uh, the historical growth has already reached a quasi-linear stage. We can assume that the rate of this growth is close to the maximum growth rate, or maybe is the maximum growth rate. So we can measure this rate, and we can express it either in absolute terms or as a percentage of total electricity supply, what we call electricity system size. Sorry. And uh, uh, it is these normalized growth rates, which is our outcome variable, which we are using to connect our historical experience to climate mitigation scenarios. And our universe of reference cases are countries. So we are measuring national growth rates for our three technologies. We are measuring them for all countries with electricity systems large enough and technology expansion level high enough. And in this figure, solid dot represents these historical growth rates. The rates are on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have electricity system size. And uh, the crosses are countries where the growth is still accelerating, so we can't measure the maximum historical growth rate. So we are not using them in our analysis, but we are just keeping an eye on them to make sure that they are not already higher than our maximum growth rate. And this is for wind power, and here we can see, for example, that for smaller countries, maximum growth rate can be higher than for very large countries. And we can also observe that with the exception of a single outliers, this maximum growth rates of wind power do not exceed 2% of the electricity system size per year. And if we look at solar, the picture generally is the same, and the rates are even lower. But for nuclear power, the picture is completely different. Because here we have France, where the maximum growth rate in the 1980s is about 10% of the electricity system size per year. And we have quite a few countries where the rates are between 5 and 7%. So just to show you how it looks in the historical perspective, this is the evolution of electricity supply in France, where different colors show different sources of electricity. And this expanding purple wedge is nuclear power. And it is pushing out fossil fuels, which are below this wedge. But it also drives quite significant growth of total electricity supply. And these three features, rapidly expanding low carbon sources, pushing out fossil fuels and driving electricity supply, oh, and by the way, it was also politically induced, uh, are similar to what we have in most climate mitigation scenarios, which makes this example relevant. But now let's move on to building our feasibility space. So we can start with our national maximum growth rates. These are the rates for solar. Let's just put it on a side. Uh, we can measure the density of these rates. And here the line represents the density, and the box below is the interquartile range with a thick median in the middle. Then, based on this density, we can construct a simple one-dimensional feasibility space, like this, where the darkest shade is the area where the frequency of historical precedence is the highest, and the white area is where no historical precedent is found at all. And having built this space, we can also superimpose scenario data over it. So this is uh, for 1.5 degree consistent scenarios from AR6. And this is for Asia, the largest region which is critical to the global transition, and where the growth and decline rates of different sources are, almost, are often the highest. Uh, so for each pathway, we measure one maximum growth rate between 2020 and 2050, and then we summarize uh, them in this way. So the box again is the interquartile range with the median, and the violin is the total density of all rates in this category of scenarios. And we can also do this for two-degree consistent scenarios, and having built this setup, we can do some reasoning. So if this is the highest historical rate for solar power, we can see that uh, three-fourths of 1.5 degree consistent pathways and uh, almost half of two degree consistent pathways have maximum growth rate higher than, than any historical precedent. And we were actually a little bit surprised to see this because we hear a lot about unprecedented growth of solar, accelerated growth of solar, but if you measure sort of solar growth compared to the electricity system size, and compare them to scenarios, there is actually a big gap. So this is solar. Uh, for wind, the picture is generally similar, although the gap is a little bit smaller. But again, nuclear is completely different. Uh, because 
Even uh, the median historical rate for nuclear power encompasses all scenario rates for nuclear power. And if we look at the third quartile of historical rates for nuclear, it encompasses almost everything, say for a handful of outliers we have uh, for solar and wind in these most ambitious uh, climate mitigation scenarios. So basically, if we could grow solar or wind with the rate, with the speed, with which nuclear power was growing in the 1980s, we could bring about the most ambitious climate mitigation scenarios. Which brings us to a question for further research. What made this impressive growth of nuclear power in the 1980s possible? Was there something about the technology nuclear power? Or was this a characteristic of the socio-political context? For example, a combination of vertically integrated power monopolies and the urgency of oil crisis. So now we can collect all these scenario rates and uh, historical rates together. And here we can make some uh, comparisons across technologies. And for example, here we can see that historical growth rate for solar and wind actually resemble uh, scenario rates for nuclear power. And uh, historical growth rates for nuclear power resemble scenario rates for solar and wind. So for each energy source, there is a gap between historical rates and scenario rates, although it works in a different direction. And uh, this gap becomes only bigger this time because this figure compares SR 1.5 scenarios to recent AR6 scenarios. And we can see that the median rates for nuclear have become lower, whereas the median rates for solar and wind have become even higher, just increasing the gaps. So this was about individual technologies, but now let me present some brief observations about total low-carbon electricity, including our three technologies, but also hydro and uh, biomass. And for a lump of technologies, we can't reliably measure growth rates, so I will just show the picture how they were growing. So here we have low-carbon electricity generation per capita on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have an important contextual variable, total electricity generation. And it is important in this context because to achieve decarbonization, we need to grow low carbon generation faster than total generation. And also because many scenarios involve quite significant growth of total electricity generation, sort of decarbonization through electrification. So this is a historical trajectory for Europe. And here we see uh, two periods of significant decarbonization, one of them being the growth of nuclear in the 1980s, and the other is a more recent growth of renewables against the backdrop of stagnating or even declining total demand. But if we add uh, information on climate mitigation scenarios here, uh, we can see that uh, to achieve, uh, to get uh, to most uh, <coughs> levels envisioned by scenarios, even for Europe, an a significant acceleration of growth would be required and a change of trend would be necessary. And we can also put Asia in the same figure. It starts a little bit later in time, 1971. And you can see the sort of current position of Asia is approximately where Europe was uh, 50 years ago. And for Asia also a significant change of trend would be necessary. So now on to some conclusions. So growth rates of renewables in climate mitigation scenarios are higher than historical precedents, and for nuclear power, it is the other way around. The growth of low carbon power in Europe in the 1970s and 80s is a prominent precedent of the required growth in climate mitigation scenarios. And finally, the conditions that made such growth possible require further analysis. Thank you for your attention. Great questions. Let me take Vivian because he hasn't asked a question this session. Hey, thanks a lot for this presentation. I was wondering if you managed to identify some conditions that allow to differentiate the growth rates, maximum growth rate between countries, like some hindering or enabling factors. So in this particular work, we didn't go into these conditions because it was explicitly uh, sort of building an outside perspectives. So in, in a sense, because science is a collective endeavor, so somebody absolutely needs to look into these conditions, but we may not need to look at these conditions in every individual research. 
Uh, but, uh, for example, I mentioned uh, some uh, features of this uh, nuclear power growth in the 1980s, um, sort of this uh, vertically integrated uh, monopolies, power monopolies, uh, sort of the, the active role of state in France, plus the urgency of uh, oil crisis. You also and mentioned, Vadim, about small and big countries, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. In this small countries faster. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, this is probably, when we are looking at the global regions, uh, this may be not very relevant, but yes, in small countries, typically higher rates are possible. Yes. Thank you. My, my understanding of one reason why you get that linear growth is because at some point, the capacity to produce the capital stock basically stays at what you would need to to maintain it at its peak. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, just thinking about what happened in France, if, if there were uh, a political commitment to overbuild the mm -hmm. capacity to produce these renewable technologies with the understanding that the, the later stranded assets, those would be covered by public funds, mm -hmm. could, could that allow us to uh, move at the speed that these uh, AR6 scenarios are suggesting? Uh, so, in principle, in theory, it is possible because uh, technically we have everything to build in this speed. But economically, it depends on what uh, governments can do and are willing to do. So, basically, this French experience shows us uh, that it is uh, difficult to achieve this without, uh, without strong government will. But, uh, for example, uh, because all these uh, low-carbon technologies, both renewable and nuclear, are sort of heavily rely on upfront cost of investment, so the overall cost of electricity heavily depends on the cost of capital. So uh, some countries, probably not European countries, but some countries which are, uh, which are able to channel uh, cheap state back financing into the development of the sector can create serious advantages for the sectors. Yeah, I'm sorry I came in late, but I, I had a, uh, the question on the technology. It seems that the growth rate would tend to be nonlinear just because as the share of uh, these intermittent sources rises, you would think you would need additional technologies to deal with, uh, with storage, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, there are actually, because uh, this magic sort of growth curve, they summarize different factors, sort of both driving and limiting technology development, and yes, uh, technology deployment, and yes, intermittency can uh, be one of the factors limiting growth and lead, uh, leading to a nonlinear pattern. Great. Thank you so much, Fadi. Oh, do we have... Okay, we'll take one more. Okay. You're the last one. Thank, Thank you. you very much. A very small curiosity question. Um, did you try to look at other renewables like biomass or hydro? And would it even be relevant to look at other sources of energy, not just renewables? Mm, we looked at patterns not of coal growth, uh, but of coal decline in the article which has already been published. And Jessica was showing feasibility space pro from that article. Uh, hydro is a little bit special because in the modern world it is typically is developing in huge chunks, basically big hydro projects. So in our experience, it is difficult to build, and it sort of it is uh, heavily determined by high by availability of hydro resources in country. So it is very difficult to build the smooth curves for hydro, and biomass also a special source because there is something close to traditional biomass. There are actually new technologies for producing biomass electricity, but there is also a practice of adding sort of five percent of biomass to coal or something, so again, for biomass, uh, the curves may not be very clear. And for biomass, in theory, we, may, uh, we might be need to disentangle different components of biomass electricity, different, uh, different sub-technologies within this technology. Well, still, Vadim is being too humble. He did look at biomass growth rates, <laughs> in short, and they're not as impressive as renewables or nuclear, generally, I think, except very, very specific cases so far. Are, are there any questions online? Okay, yeah. Um, okay, great. So Vivian, it, one, yeah. <laughs> and Vivian is our next presenter.
There are some online questions while you are adjusting. You may be able to take them at the end. They are to Oliver and uh, Roger and to Jessica. Um, so hello everybody, I'm Vivian Fischometto from the University of Geneva and I'm glad to present here um, a starting work uh, which is part of the accuracy project where we use extensive retrospective modeling to define new accuracy and feasibility benchmarks for long range national energy projections. So, Fast energy transition is needed for the next decades in the European power sector to reach carbon neutrality, but it's, it is constrained, as you know, by societal factors. Indeed, past energy transitions have not been cost optimal, and there are factors beyond cost, and any energy transitions depends on the co-evolution of different systems with our technical, institutional, political, social, or economic, for instance. So it creates a feasibility space which is dynamic. And energy system models are widely used to provide um, energy transition pathways and should hence include social transformation factors to provide realistic and feasible pathways and to highlight, uh, to better inform about climate policies. And historical energy transitions can give insights to integrate um, specific fa factors that are con more country and country specific, as you just shown uh, in your last presentation for the uh, historical growth rate. So all models are wrong, but maybe some can be improved. So so far, national energy system and social uh, social studies have largely evolved in parallel, with only a low level of integration in existing studies, and with only few cases of deep societal factors integration in model, with uh, integration of feedbacks and integration between energy systems and society. And there is, however, an emerging literature using what we call socio-technical energy transition model, which are kind of model which allows to link energy modeling and transition studies. And this is consistent with the recent call to re better represent some potential, potential influencing factors, such as institutions or social support for some technologies. But even if we increase the complexity uh, of a model, a uh, more complex model is not necessarily a better model, in, especially in terms of uh, capturing the historical dynamics. And so hand casting assessments can be an interesting exercise to um, assist the way we build our uh, model. But there is so far a scarcity of hand casting exercises to, for energy economic model. And they are mainly used to discuss only the model performance, but not to assist the model building phase. And in our case, the societal factors integration phase. And it has never been ap applied as well to multiple countries at the same time to allow more generating fi findings and as well more country specific findings. So our research questions are, to what extent does integration of societal factors in national energy system model improve or not improve in casting performance? Is there any heterogeneity between countries in terms of accuracy and societal factors that we need to integrate in models? And how can casting be used to inform about the feasibility of future climate targets that we want to reach in the power sector in European countries? So uh, I'm going to be really fast in the description of the model. So we build a, a bottom-up simulation model. We're using 14 technologies. So it's an annual time step. And investments and dispatch decision are separated. So it's a simulation model and not um, cost optimization model. And so we use an input uh, a historical data set uh, that we build of national electric systems, such as cost, technical potential, or electricity demand. And then our model calculates for every year the capacity installed and the data generation for each technology, uh, cumulative system cost as well, and the CO2 emissions. And finally, we compare our outputs with values from historical pathways using relevant accuracy indicator for hint casting. And this methodology is applied to one techno-economic oriented model, what we could call a base ve baseline version of the model. Uh, so without societal factors include, and then to six modified model structures where, oh, sorry, problem. Uh, 
where we include as well uh, six different associated factors. And then we extend this work to 31 countries. So the associated factors we are including and we want to include, uh, so we selected these factors, transformation, associated factors, sorry, uh, so it's related to infrastructure dynamics, actors and decision making uh, or social and institutional context. And our selection is based on recent reviews um, uh, highlighting these factors as influential. And uh, you can see on the slide the way we want to integrate it in the model. Uh, so it's, we represent in the model these uh, factors uh, in a, either in a stylized way or using more empirical data. And finally, for each country, we select the best fitting model structure based on the accuracy indicator, and we build energy transition scenarios to 2030, so which generalize really short-term energy transition. And then the outputs are compared with national climate targets to discuss, uh, to discuss a bit the feasibility of reaching these targets. So our, re our results are very preliminary. preliminary sorry. So I first show you for one country as an example, like so the Great Britain here, the influence of societal factors inclusion on the accuracy to capture historical dynamics. And there, are, there are three graphs here representing the annual installed power capacity from 1990 to 2018. And on the top left, you can see the observed transition and the two of the graphs being outputs from the models with two different model structures. And then we compare the hint casting performance uh, using an aggregated accuracy indicator for which the lower the value, the lower the deviation with the past uh, observations and the better uh, is the accuracy. And what we see basically is when we include the actual heterogeneity factor, the accuracy value is lower compared to the observed transition. And it's because it allows to better capture the recent increase of um, uh, renewables in Great Britain uh, from 2010. And then we compare, we do the same thing, uh, including like testing different model structures, and we do it for like uh, six European countries. And for this heat map, you can see on the X axis, the countries we studied so far, and on the Y axis, the different version of model structures analyzed. And what we can see at first, like the representing higher inertia dynamics inc tend to increase deviation in terms of capacity installed for all countries. Like the actors' heterogeneity integration improves the hint casting performance for most of the countries except France, to a large extent for Belgium, with a decrease of three points, and a smaller extent for Austria. And uh, adding cost of capital, so different cost of capital per country and per technology, um, increase the accuracy um, in uh, some countries, but not in all countries. And you can see like for France, the accuracy seems to be better compared to others, but its results are a bit biased because during the period we studied, the capacity installed doesn't, didn't change a lot, both in the model and in the reality. And finally, we analyze the potential short-term transition in the actual context. So we don't, didn't add more uh, climate policies and we try to in incorporate a sudden increase of gas price from 2022 to take into account the recent context of uh, Yukon war. And sorry, my slide changed. I uh, can't control it. <laughs> And basically what you can see just to, when we integrate uh, his, his, the hint casting inform model, we see that like the projection of renewables will change in 2030, increasing so that's the annual generation. And we see that when we compare, when we compare the different uh, and share of annual generation, it changed when we include, uh, we use our hint casting model. So it's important to include uh, societal factors to, if you want to, do a feasibility assessment of future targets. So our preliminary conclusions, the integration of societal factors in models can improve hint casting performance to a large extent for some factors and to a smaller extent for others. And heterogeneity between countries, we found some heterogeneity between countries in terms of potential hint casting performance gain when we include some societal factors. And in terms of societal transformation factors that we want to, that we need to include. So maybe the model structure need to, uh, to be adapted to each country if we want to analyze the potential feasibility. 
And hint casting as a size can be used here to adapt the, yeah, what I was said, the energy model structure to each country to better capture some really specific factor and to improve the prospective feasibility assessment. And so, yeah, we have still some work in progress to extend this work and to integrate in a, simultaneously the different factors because they, they could have some uh, interaction bet between the factors when we include, uh, it, include the, included them in a like, multiple way. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. So, okay. uh, are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's working. <laughs> uh, so, my name is Ansar. I came from Lums, Pakistan. So, my question is uh, how you uh, formulate the societal behavior? So, social information, uh, so, so to speak, how you incorporate the social information? So, to my knowledge, it's very difficult to formulate and model. So, how, what steps you took? Uh, it's very very nice work that you did so just just elaborate more so yeah thank you for your question so to be honest sometimes it's really difficult to implement so for instance for the financial financial context we just use some uh, different uh, discount rate per technologies and per country to represent the uh, different risk for investors uh, and it depends on like uh, financial context in country and between yeah, technologies. And for others, it's, uh, it could be like really stylized. For instance, when we want to represent vested interests, we add some, uh, the model can tend to choose more the technologies with already a higher market share. So that's sometimes it's really stylized and we use some parameter values that are already used in the literature. So it's, but sometimes it like, yeah, and for instance, for social support for technology, we, we're going to use the Eurobarometer when you, there are some surveys uh, showing the social support for renewables, for instance. And then we, yeah, we, we're trying to incorporate this kind of data in the model. Um, thank you, Vivian. It's very interesting work. I, my question is, uh, you mentioned that it's not the least cost uh, model or not, uh, or rather simulation model. And my question is, what are the drivers of the uh, investors' decisions on specific capacity expansions, especially when you look at the past? And um, what are their objective functions or how they are basically deciding on, 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 um, in your model on, on uh, expansion of particular types of technologies? Okay, thank you for your question. So basically it's based on the in a very technical like approach on the, the different technologies you already have, and so the potential capacity factors, they have to meet the uh, uh, load demand curve. So because it's uh, for the generation, it's a mod now a model at the hourly step. And then um, the, dif the drivers are the projected demand, which is different from the real demand you will meet. Uh, and we do that because in order to represent the overcapacity construction in Europe because of wrong expectation about energy demand. For instance, in Spain, it was uh, the case. Thank you so much, Vivian. I have a question. So I'm going to ask the technical people to put your slides back up. I hope they do, because it will make answering my question easier. Your conclusion was that we need to represent societal factors, and you showed these two approaches of representing societal factors and then not. So this hind casting and not. But how close would your results need to be or how different would your results need to be to not have that conclusion? Because I mean, these two results looked quite similar to me. Yeah, so you mean the last slide was a 25% and the... Yeah, exactly. So I mean, when I look at these, I say, okay, well, why do you need to integrate societal yeah. factors? They're so similar. How, yeah. I can go there. Uh, Okay, it doesn't work. Yeah, basically, uh, I've just done it to show a difference, but because the, um, we integrate that the model prefers uh, the choice for um, technology depend on also on the market, the actual market share. At the end, you will have a kind of tipping points. 
So, it's, and, but in this uh, scenario that I showed you, there is no climate policies, so there is no like carbon price at all. So, if you, my it's an assumption, but I, I think that it's going to change a lot. The at the end, the the capacity, the capacity generation will d diverge a bit more because we we didn't add more let's say uh, incentive, incentives to invest in renewables. So. Thank you. Very interesting work, really. Um, on the societal transformation factors also, the actors, heterogeneity, what is your indicator there, or how do you build it? So, so far, we didn't disaggregate the, um, like the different actors. So, basically, we used uh, just so far a parameter uh, which represent uh, the cost sensitivity to invest. And so, we just decreased like, uh, so it's very stylized way so far, this parameter value to take into account that the, the cost perceptions between actors is different. But, and uh, yeah, in terms of actors' heterogeneity, we also uh, um, maybe want to include more the, the way that like if um, the, the cost, oh, sorry, doing that. The cost sensitivity to invest will change if for a country where it's more public oriented or where it's a completely liberalized market. And that's kind of actors at we we're going to include as well. But yeah, so far it's a, just a parameter, a parameter value that we change. Great, thank you so much Vivian. And <laughs> our next speaker is Adrian talking about the EU hydrogen target. In a second, <laughs> perhaps. That's a bit too far, but let's start here. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for sitting through and welcome to today's last talk. Uh, I'm Adrian, I'm a PhD student at the Potsdam Institute and happy to present our most recent work here on uh, probabilistic feasibility spaces for analyzing the upscaling of energy technologies. Now for this work we particularly look at uh, green hydrogen as a particular case of a green energy technology. However, I also want to put the focus of today's talk a bit on the general mythological approach, which we think is also applicable to other early energy technologies. And I should highlight that this has now been uh, accepted in Nature Energy, which I'm happy about, so you can uh, yeah, find it there in a few weeks, hopefully, as well. So just to motivate this a bit, uh, why do we look into green hydrogen, for example? What you're seeing here is the IEA hydrogen project database that shows, um, now here for the EU, global uh, elec well, uh, electrolysis projects for the EU. Global uh, numbers will be coming in a second. And what we can see is uh, that, well, it has been growing in the past quite substantially. And that's actually, so we have a huge pipeline of projects that is actually also picking up even more so in the future with future announcements. And if all those were realized, we'd actually get to well below triple uh, digit growth rate, so around 100% or so per year. However, there is a bit of a catch to this because, and this is now the same projects by status instead of by region. If we look at that, we see that most of those are actually listed in a feasibility uh, study status or even, um, or even, oops, it's jumping around or even um, only as a concept study um, in uh, 2030 or so. So most of those, around 80%, are not backed by a final investment decision in 2023, which really calls into question the reliability of these um, broad announcements. Uh, on the global level, numbers are a bit different. The general pattern is similar. This would lead to even around 200% growth rates, so really, uh, well, yeah, unforeseen. And however, same story here, most of those are still unsure. So what we then basically asked ourselves, so I mean, there's really clearly a lot of uh, hype and hope around the uh, hydrogen sphere here. And we asked ourselves, well, can we trust these visions or how do we make sense of that? And for that, we um, constructed uh, what we call the probabilistic feasibility space. So based on, um, well, yeah, also Jessica and Ali's work. And what we um, find is that essentially, just to highlight the challenge, um, so with green hydrogen, we're really down there still. I mean, so, so um, globally, we're at around 600 megawatts globally, and we need to get up there, which is 3.6 to 5 terawatts, according to the IEA and 
IRENA um, scenarios. So that really means that hydrogen and electrolysis capacity needs to grow by a factor of 6,000 to 8,000 in 30 years, which is quite a staggering number compared to the, well, you could argue only required tenfold of renew renewable energy increase that we need to see in the same uh, time frame. Now, to model um, what, uh, how this um, capacity diffusion could take place. We look at three uncertain parameters, which we then vary by Monte Carlo analysis. The first one of which is the initial, what we call the initial capacity. Why is that uncertain? It is uncertain because we don't take today's value, which we know, which is certain, so not those 600 megawatts globally, but rather we want to look a bit into the future to include some of the momentum that's building up, but only that part that we're, where we can argue that is uh, relatively certain that that will um, occur. So we look a bit into the future, but not too far as to not include, for example, really uncertain certain 2030 capacity announcements. So second one, that's a little blue triangle down there, is um, our second uncertain parameter is the um, um, emergence growth rate, which is really the growth rate that is realized as long as the asymptote is still far away. Now, um, talking about the asymptote, that's also the question, well, what do we do with that? So one option would be to just leave it free and just let the model decide. So basically leave it as a free parameter and fit this to the data. Now we argue that for green hydrogen or basically for all energy uh, new, very new energy technologies, this doesn't really work so well simply because it's very sensitive to potentially random fluctuations in the last few data points, but also to the, to the model, for example. And therefore, uh, we sort of dismiss this as one option. Now, another option could be that we just fix it to one single value. Now, that's also been done uh, by others, uh, for example, for solar PV. Now, we argue that um, this doesn't quite capture the actual um, market environment of green hydrogen, because what green hydrogen and what also so other energy, uh, very early energy technologies are characterized by is something that's been called the three-sided chicken and egg problem. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm showing you this, uh, not just because uh, it's a good picture and that draws attention, but also because this really describes this three-sided problem that we don't only have to ramp up supply, which is what we're looking at here, so not just the supply side of electrolysis of green hydrogen, but also simultaneously demand and infrastructure. And for example, that is very different to, for example, the um, upscaling of solar PV, where um, demand for for electricity was already in place and which could also tap into existing infrastructure, namely the electricity grid. So for green hydrogen, that's not the case and arguably it's not the case for other early energy technologies as well. And therefore, what we really try to do is to do something like a middle way, so to stay like a middle course between leaving the asymptote free and fixing it to one single value. And we therefore make it steadily increasing over time, uh, which sort of um, then represents the growing uh, green hydrogen market that um, we are seeing over the years. We can then also basically split this up into the actual magnitude of that uh, demand pool and then how much that is anticipated by investors. And now, um, how do we get numbers for this? How do we parameterize this? So the first one, uh, we parameterize by policy targets. So basically, uh, in Jessica's lingo, that would be uh, then our, our target case, so to say. Um, for the initial capacity, that's what I just showed to you. That's the IA uh, database, so the Higher Green Hydrogen Projects database. And now the interesting part is here, for the emergence growth rate, we we really look at two different scenarios. So that's more along the lines of a predictive what-if scenario. And one of those is looking at um, the assumption that electrolysis grows similar to solar and wind. And the other one is really an emergency deployment scenario, as I'll show you on the next slide. Now, just how does this probabilistic feasibility space then look like? I'm only showing you results for the EU. Um, if you're interested in global numbers, um, look at our paper. Uh, so this is now for the scenario where green hydrogen grows similar to solar and wind. And um, so these little circles here, those are our targets. So for example, what we put in there is already the, um, <coughs> the uh, most recent Repower EU plan, which is around uh, 100 gigawatts by 2030. Um, up at least, um, well, at least by a factor of 100 or 1,000 from today's values, and um, the long-term target of 500 gigawatt um, according to the EU hydrogen strategy. Now, what we're seeing is essentially, um, now the shade here then corresponds to the likelihood of reaching a certain um, amount of electrolysis capacity over time. And what we're seeing is generally there's lots of uncertainty, but one fairly robust outcome is that there's very, fairly little supply for around 15 years. So it simply takes time until the exponential growth really starts to kick in, just because we're at so uh, such low um, capacity levels at the moment. However, what we also see is that then later on, you see like a point in time, so around 2040, when the probability mass sort of tips towards the upper end. So we see some kind of a breakthrough 
However, the timing of that breakthrough is fairly uncertain. Uh, on average, it's somewhere around 2040 or so, so still, um, well, around 20 years in the future. And even then, there's still considerable uncertainty if you look at the marginal distribution there on the right-hand side. Um, we just observe a very wide range of uh, um, uncertainty in the long run. Also, critical to highlight, undergrowth rates that are similar to solar, PV, and wind. The repower EU target is uh, out of reach here. So takeaway message here, really, short-term scarcity, long-term uncertainty. And in order to explore what would, be diff what would be possible under very different circumstances, we also looked at an emergency deployment scenario, scenario where we really looked at very, very different, well, not just, well, mostly actually non-energy technologies. So what we have here is, for example, uh, military equipment in World War II, also nuclear weapons in the US, Soviet Union. We also have uh, nuclear power in France, which we just uh, saw from Vadim, and also fracking gas, uh, but also really granular and small-scale technologies such as smartphones, e-bikes, you name it, all kinds of things. Uh, actually, the COVID vaccinations, we had to get those, we had, we had to get rid of those because they were growing way too fast to be, uh, to parameterize anything meaningfully. Um, and if we then plug this essentially back into our model, what we end up with is um, another probabilistic feasibility space under this emergency deployment scenario. And now what's interesting here is essentially, well, the breakthrough that accelerates the breakthrough considerably by around, well, for the EU, around um, 10 to 15 years or so, on the global level even more. And and this is actually now also, that's interesting, what's necessary to really keep the repower EU target within reach. And uh, I'm not fully convinced that is uh, appreciated by all policymakers when setting these uh, really ambitious targets. Now, just uh, briefly wrapping up already. So uh, method-wise, so we propose these probabilistic feasibility spaces really in order to capture the uncertainty of very new and very uh, immature energy technologies that will be needed for climate neutrality. We parameterize that by, so for once, we have the steadily increasing asymptote. And we really view that as some kind of a middle course between keeping the asymptote completely free, which we argue is, uh, does not work for uh, very early diffusion processes, and secondly, fixing it, which we argue is a bit um, over-optimist because uh, markets are simply not existent yet. Um, we also parameterize it based on initial capacity, so on the announcements and the growth rates for which we look at other technologies, which is also different to the feasibility spaces that we've seen here so far, which essentially mostly look at the same technology in a different region, and we make it differently. We look at different technologies in the same region, simply because we argue that uh, for green hydrogen, the policy landscape is changing so much, and um, historical growth is just not indicative of uh, future potential. And we apply that for green hydrogen in the EU, um, as I said, uh, also global numbers in our paper. Um, under growth that is similar to solar and wind, that really leads to short-term scarcity, so the not reaching the repower EU target by far, and long-term uncertainty, and um, emergency deployment is then what's really necessary to reach those targets. And I just got a yellow card, so I'm wrapping up, and thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. So uh, let's open the floor to any questions to Adrian and also any final remarks or reflections. So this can be a short interrogative statement followed by question mark or a statement. Thanks. Um, interesting. Uh, my question is really, can we compare the different technologies? Because if we look back to the Second World War, I mean, the political conditions were completely different. So, um, yeah, does it, mean, does it make sense to compare the different technologies across history? That's, of course, a, a reasonable question, one I expected to hear. I mean, so, I mean, we've, we've mostly thought about the, how, how comparable uh, green hydrogen or electrolysis is to solar and wind, and I mean, there are arguments both in favor and against, so they're, I mean, they are fairly modular, which makes them comparable to maybe PV or so, but also they have chunky infrastructure, and so. Um, for the emergency deployment case, we really wanted to highlight what would be possible or even feasible looking at very, very different set of technology. So uh, we're not claiming, uh, clearly not, we're agnostic towards how comparable they actually are, but only want to draw, um, well, the feasibility frontier under very exceptional other circumstances. For example, those, well, very centrally coordinated um, uh, diffusion processes like for military equipment. If a country, like, really under an emergency wartime-like deployment scenario. And I mean, we see that if the EU is serious about reaching it, the Repower EU target, that will be necessary. Great, and thank you. Um, I just want to open up a little bit like a more general like questions about particularly like I'm interested about about 
the new technology growth rates, the feasibility of growth rates of new technologies, and also like you talked about like, you know, fossil fuel decline. So that's also, you know, we need to have like a you know, very rapid decline. So that's, I mean, both has very, like a very challenge, uh, challenging like uh, task. But I'm just wondering about, because that's different. I mean, my, it seems to me a bit politically quite different challenge. And it, like technologically very similar because we need to have very large scale of decline and large scale of like technology upstake. But uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have any kind of ideas, like differences between like, you know, fossil fuel decline and like, you know, like, you know, increasing like, you know, new technology like green hydrogen or renewables and yeah. Yeah, that's my question. Adrian, do you want to say anything? Um, well, I mean, we, we, we already had a meeting about that briefly, and I discussed it also with Greg and Gunnar about, um, well, what are, I mean, in our approach now here, we're agnostic about um, how this could be achieved and whether there are really like any real world bottlenecks or so, but we only, we only make this really this, um, well, basically predictive what if setting. Um, however, there are obvious uh, candidates that we could look at regarding, for example, labor or so, uh, just candidates that are really like bottlenecks in the real world. But, uh, well, we haven't done so in our work, but maybe somebody else wants to contribute. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to, uh, let me re respond to your question, Shin. I mean, this is, so I just wrapped up a project on fossil fuel decline rates. And when we started the project, we thought, oh, okay, well, this is a completely different challenge than growth because it's very easy, in, in a way, it's politically much easier to grow new technologies because when you're growing a new technology, you're creating a new industry, you're actually creating an interest group to actually drive you up the curb, right? But when you're declining a technology, you're actually killing off an interest group. And one thing we've been super surprised with in our work is that the decline rates, the maximum decline rates and the maximum growth rates that we're finding are really similar. So the maximum decline rates, um, I mean, the highest we observe is 30% over 10 years. So that's about 3% a year normalized to the electricity system size. So this is different than the way um, Adrian is measuring growth. So the way they're measuring growth is they're taking a compound annual growth rate at the beginning of, um, the S curve. The way we're measuring growth is we're measuring it at the um, max, the maximum additions or maximum um, removals from the system normalized to the system size. So while they're both expressed in percentage, they're actually expressing very different things. But um, these, we've been super surprised about how consistent these decline rates are with these growth rates. So our gr decline rates total. Outlier maximum is the UK at 30%. General maximum is around 20% a decade, so that would be 2% every year. And then um, our general maximum of solar and wind is about 2% a year. So we've, I mean, we were really surprised at how consistent they are, which may suggest that it's similar processes. Let me take a, um, a what, well, he's gonna get the last word. Oh, Alina. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question, whether you actually know how the U derived its hydrogen gold and in, in <laughs> where it, from which model it came or what type of... Yeah. Normatively, I would argue. Um, well, I mean, so those 100 gigawatts, so that, that corresponds to 10 megatons of green hydrogen by 2030, which is around 2.5% of final energy in the EU. So um, it's not quite as significant yet, but I mean, so I'm not, I'm not sure whether. So it was uh, 40 gigawatts actually until before the Repower EU plan, that was the hydrogen strategy. And f to me, those 2.5 uh, factor of increase seems, well, arbitrary, I would say. Yeah, just in a reaction to uh, Adrian, your presentation and Jessica and uh, your work earlier, we are kind of comparing individual technologies to other individual technologies. And yet, if you look at some of the historical work, you often see clusters of technologies. And sometimes you can have technologies go faster because there's combinations. And so we had, a few years ago, we had the world record for vaccine development that was four times faster than the previous world record, which was measles in the 50s. That's because we had a new general purpose technology that enabled things to go much faster. So, you know, there may be some benefit to think about emergency conditions as enablers of rapid speed, but also combinations, because we also have a lot of general purpose technologies that are moving forward now um, that could enable some of these things as well. So we may need to be open to that. 
Okay, I have three people on my list and then we're gonna wrap up. So I wanna give Oliver your, yep. Yeah, yeah, just quick because I was a little bit provoked by you saying, okay, these targets are arbitrary. They are of course arbitrary. These are commission strategy documents. This is not EU legislation. This is not an official EU target. It is something to communicate. You can still, of course, do an analysis. Would that be achievable? So it's not against doing that analysis. But I think the eventual target that will emerge from that will be different either on the hydrogen level or on the share of green hydrogen in that. Yeah, I have a general comment on the session, um, and that is that um, a lot of focus was on the on the um, supply side, and then we had uh, a few points where demand sides uh, shimmered through, and I I just think that's super important for us to understand. Um, for example, the work that you do, um, like how quickly we can decline fossils, how quickly we can decline demand use, um, and and compare that to the scenarios, just because there's such an asymmetry, and I I just feel. Um, we might drastically underestimate the challenges that we have on the demand side, it's, uh, on the feasibility side, so maybe that's something to consider. Yeah, and actually the S-curve came from demand. I mean, it came from the spread of social practices, <laughs> so we can use the S-curve for it. Oh, no, no, I was just pointing someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so then I'll like, um, oh, I'm sorry, right, you're right. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. Just a quick remark on the, um, work that you're doing and, and Vadim was also mentioning on the on the growth rate, I think it's absolutely crucial from the uh, modeling point of view, from the power system, energy modeling. Um, and I, I think, you know, that uh, actually the, the assumptions that we as a modeler make on the growth rates is often marginalized actually. We tend to focus on, on the assumptions, on the demand, on, on the costs, and then selecting the growth rates actually uh, a little bit arbitrary and also marginalizing the question on whether these growth rates are actually um, can be able to be prolonged over the long period of time, over 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and looking uh, from the experience of, of, of uh, applying various power system models to various countries, we often see that there is one technology that is actually dominant, either solar or the wind, and the amount that we see at the very end of the modeling horizon is often driven by the value of the growth rate that we're inserting. So this is basically the very, very crucial thing that you're working on from the modeling perspective. Thank you. Alec, I give you the last word. Thank you, Jessica, and, and everyone. It was, um, I think for me, it exceeded this, my expectations. You know, how much interesting and new stuff I, I got from this session. And I, 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 w I won't be able to do justice with my like, couple of remarks. But, um, oops, 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 oops. but things I, I wanted to emphasize is that um, maybe that kind of your you know, common in many, many of the presentations is that when we produce scenarios by models, or even when we produce them by other methods, we, our task is not to establish their probability. But when we ask about feasibility, that comes a completely different thing. And that's why, and all of you emphasized it, and that's why, you know, we need this kind of, within scenario communities, this little of what Jessica called an outside view on scenarios. And, and one thing, another thing which I noticed is that, and well, this is what Teresa noticed when she projected COVID and, you know, and, uh, and the war in Ukraine. And of course, these are two things which kind of go wrong in the world and we are not envisioned by scenarios, right? But there are millions of other things, right, which can go wrong and not envisioned by scenarios. And that's also precisely what is not, this is one of these unobserved variables that Jessica referred to, right? That is why we need to look in history where things actually go wrong and see how fast we can move. Now, I, um, I also would like to, like Jessica highlighted three presentations, but I also would like to notice that Rogers and Vivian's presentations, they were clearly with a hint of, of the outside view, and they had a very interesting, you know, angle on it. One was hindcasting. You know, when you can't develop an outside view by checking your model, which was happened in the past, right? Or checking the scenario, how well they predict. And this is like a valid way to, you know, develop an outside check on scenarios. And um, uh, 
the answer was actually what you used to use IAA projections, right? And then, you know, we sometimes have discussion of your work, and Jessica says, oh, this is just comparison of one scenario with other scenarios. And it may be so, but I mean, I think IAA projections, as secretive as they are, they're not really kind of scenarios in this sense. They're not trying to portray desirable or undesirable futures. They're just trying to look what's in the cooking you know, and just project it forward. So it's essentially, it's a present or even kind of the past lived in the future in the IA scenario. So it's essentially a very similar method. Um, my final comment is a little bit on demand side on what, you know, Gunnar like brought up and also what uh, Elena mentioned when she mentioned the social cultural dimension which is unexplored. And I think this is a huge thing because I think what happens when we see that these tasks of climate change are very difficult on supply side and we know so much about supply side, and then our thinking shifts, oh, then let's just go on demand side and do something there. But we do very little systematic work. It's the same degree of systematic, right? I wish we could build like S-curves and collect empirical data and just compare or, and, and but however, um, Gregor Semenyuk, I think is one of the examples, that's why we were so lucky to have him here. One of the examples, which is the first step towards it at a very, very sort of, you know, big level, and, um, and maybe we should develop this work more. On that note, I would like once again to thank you. I see bus looming on the horizon. That's exactly <laughs> very, very good timing. No, very good timing. We're just about to conclude. Thank you very much, and uh, see you later at the forum.